endlessly with each other about exactly what livability is. Um, and I have this kind of a <coughs> peakish little notion that, that one of the reasons they wanted to subcontract out the work was they wanted to ask somebody else to try to figure out what a, what a, what a, what a definition of, of, of livability is. But we tossed this around at considerable length, and what we finally decided was that, that we came up with a common sense definition of, 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 of livability, uh, which is at the, at the root, um, <clears throat> at the root um, of, of, of the good life is economic prosperity. So we saw economic prosperity um, as, a central, as a central notion of livability. But we saw at the same time, we said that this must be consistent with, this must be supportive of, uh, the other values um, of human safety in terms of transportation safety issues, uh, the broad issues of human health and how environmental issues bear, bear on human health, and then on the, on the more general issues of, of environmental protection and sustainability. So this is how we kind of put together um, our concept of livability and transportation. And there were two themes, uh, supporting themes, research themes, that, that we decided should be on our work. And the first of these is what uh, <clears throat> what can be called scalability. Uh, that is scalability by the size of the jurisdiction that you're dealing with. And so we created a framework of four different uh, levels of jurisdiction. Uh, the first is local or, or the township. Uh, next up are metropolitan areas and counties. The third level up uh, are states. And then the fourth level up uh, are, interstate, uh, are interstate corridors. And there's no shortage of work being done, experimental and research work, um, on, on livability at the local level. If there's any number of experiments, uh, more than experiments, going on around the country in terms of bike paths, pedestrian walkways, uh, <clears throat> getting a fusion of, of, of zoning ordinances to, 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 to complement uh, transit routes, that kind of thing, going on all over the place. Uh, but our experience was, what, 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 we, what we observed was that we couldn't see any of these experiments uh, that actually would be able to be expanded to, that could be enlarged to larger, larger jurisdictions. And so we thought that the unique thing that we could do is we could say, wait a minute, <clears throat> let's look at transportation and livability projects and research efforts that can be applied at a minimum at two levels, uh, two jurisdictional levels, and ideally uh, at three or four. And uh, you're all well aware of the fact that we've got the, the phenomenon of the megapolis is growing and growing for more and more megapolises around the country. And the ones we've got um, are, 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 are more and more robust. And even within the metropolitan area, we find metropolitan areas are becoming increasingly uh, in, in, integrated for, uh, you know, for both demographic reasons and because of the application of, of IT. Uh, so those were two, the, 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 all the more reason, oh, because of the growth of the, 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 the growth of the importance of megapolises and the growth of, of integrated uh, metropolitan areas, all the more reason to try to look at livability and transportation models that could be applied at larger jurisdictional levels. Um, and then the second, the second research principle that, that we established uh, to, to, to inform our work <clears throat> is that we, should, we would conduct public opinion survey research in developing our plans. Now, in, in one sense, that's kind of a self-evident proposition because if we look at the transportation planning process, the land use planning process, uh, you, you, you see it almost always involves significant public input. Um, but, but above and beyond that, uh, one has, only has to look around at just about any tr significant transportation development, certainly here in, in, in the Washington area with, with, with the development of our, of our metro system and all sorts of controversial issues have arisen. And our feeling was that if we were to develop notions of transportation livability while always keeping our ear to the ground or our eye out about public opinion, we would be able to come up uh, with projects and programs that were more generally acceptable and that would minimize conflict. So those were the those were the two general principles that we developed that would that would inform our con, our continued work on, on, on transportation and mobility. So that's just a very very brief overview to kind of set the the, the general the general tone for for our presentations uh, this morning. And we're going to have <clears throat> we're going to have five presentations. We will start. I'll, I'll be introducing each of the presenters individually as they come up. I don't want to burden you with five biographies all at once. Uh, but just a brief overview. Now we will start with a presentation on looking at, at some highly innovative research techniques for identifying hotspots, uh, congestion hotspots. And of course, congestion hotspots have, have environmental implications, and the environmental implications have health implications. So we'll start out with, with, uh, with some, uh, dis a description of some really interesting work um, in, in, in that area. Um, 
Then we're going to move to two presentations on, uh, that focus on, on the health implications um, uh, of transportation and livability. Uh, then we will then move to um, a, uh, <clears throat> a presentation on the uh, direct contribution of, um, of, of transportation, and in particular, freight transportation to economic prosperity. If freight transportation is something that is uh, perhaps among transportation researchers not as given as much attention as it should be, so we want to focus attention on that. And then the final presentation will be a wrap-up that brings together all these ideas in, into kind of an overview of, of, of the transportation um, and livability paradigm. Uh, so with those introductory comments, I would like to introduce uh, first Dr. Kingsley Haynes, uh, who, who, um, who will speak on new methods for evaluating the impact of transportation investment. Let me just say a word about, about Kingsley. Uh, Kingsley is formally right now holds the Hazel Chair in Public Policy at George Mason University, but those of us who know him think of him as the founding dean of the School of Public Policy. He, he, he took the school from um, a, uh, I think a $20,000 enterprise to a $20 million enterprise uh, in a very short period of time. He built a faculty from, I think, two faculty members to uh, 60 faculty members. Um, and uh, before coming here, he's had, in addition to his academic experience, he's had considerable consulting experience um, and uh, uh, working on transportation and environmental issues. Uh, so with that, Kingsley. Livability is a is a very very difficult area to get a handle. We all know the good parts of it: uh, walkability, uh, better health, uh, 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 better jobs, a variety of issues that kind of come together. But uh, trying to do analysis on it, trying to isolate pieces that can then be put together, is very difficult in its own right. One of the most important things in trying to do that has to do with understanding the way in which spillovers occur within the system. In other words, decisions that are made someplace in the system, whether it be a, a, an issue with regard to education, whether it's an issue with regard to new investments in transportation, etc., how do they spill over to other aspects of the system? And so one of the things that I'm going to look at with you just very briefly is the way in which two kinds of research are coming together that look at this spillover question. Um, I'm not going to focus so much on the uh, health areas and others, but rather look at the spillovers from investments in transportation. So we have an investment in transportation at a particular location. What happens to areas around it? Who gets what? Um, what kinds of things begin to happen as we begin to change the pricing profile in transportation? Um, we're used to the kind of general issues, but there's a lot of indirect effects that are very, very important. Um, and what I'm going to do is really talk about two pieces of research areas that are coming together for this. One is what we call what the more traditional um, <laughs> approach to uh, transportation investment, a kind of production function approach where we have an output, we have a series of inputs, one of those inputs being transportation, obviously, a set of inputs, and we ask, over time, given a change in investment in that transportation, how does it affect regional development, new jobs, output of various kinds, okay? And that work that is very, very well developed, I mean, the work has been developed for years, looking at um, uh, traditional production functions, such as, uh, such as the Cobb-Douglas production function, estimated usually with an ordinary least squares model of one kind or another, um, is very common. And increasingly, that work is being extended with what's called spatial econometrics. And spatial econometrics are simply the issue that observations that you're using 
are not independent of each other um, because in fact not only are they dependent in time, which economists have seen for a very, very long time, uh, uh, a period time one is dependent on the period prior and the period after that is dependent on that period so that what we need to do when we look at observations over time is to understand that ought, that serial correlation through time and control for it because our observations are supposed to be independent of each other. Okay, So we know how to do that. Economists have worked on this for years and really developed very nice tools for spotting the issue and then for making adjustments in it. However, in the last, uh, in the last 20 years, what has developed is a set of observations that said not only are things dependent on each other over time, they're dependent on each other in space. So that if I'm located here and I make an adjustment of one kind or another, you're affected not just through time, but because you and I are interdependent with each other in a particular space. So this is the kind of activity that has taken place, has extended all of this traditional work using regression models, has extended it in terms of not just time control, but trying to look at these spatial interactions. This is particularly important with regard to transportation because we know transportation affects other spaces, right? An investment in downtown affects the suburbs. Investment in the suburbs affects the downtown. So we know that there's these interdependencies, but until about 10, 15 years ago, this was not well worked out. This was something that was obvious. It was something people usually put a control variable in, such as a distance variable or something. But in effect, they really didn't understand the relative dependency, spatial dependency, of all the variables in the model. So here we have something we're trying to explain with a set of variables here. We're controlling for those sets of variables through time. That's fine. But guess what? We need to control for those variables in terms of observations around them. So that this spatial econometric advancement is very, very important. Independent of that, and almost completely independent, is a set of work in what's called computable general equilibrium. Oh, that's a mouthful. All it really means is what we're talking about is the interdependence of buying and selling within an economy. Okay? It's, if you're used to input-output modeling, it's similar to that except we take the parts that are related to um, services such as housing and other things and expand those components, okay? And we call it a SAM, a, spatial, a, a social accounting matrix, okay? But it's built off many of the things we used to use as input-output modeling. There's a huge literature on this. And there's a huge group in economics going off in what we call computable general equilibrium modeling. What they have done in the last little while is begin to link regions to other regions. So if we have a metropolitan area, we talk about it buying and selling within the metropolitan area. What, what about it does it buy and sell from adjacent regions? In other words, what is the spatial interdependency? But they do it. In a, in a closed model of what's called um, computable general equilibrium. These two approaches to analysis were almost independent of each other. There are entire groups of people who have meetings, the size of the meeting we're having here in terms of the association, and all they do is different kinds of computable general equilibrium models. They became very fashionable in the, when we were doing a lot of work on environment, um, but they're also related to international trade because of the trade component associated with this. So this whole piece has kind of gone off on its own. At the same time, this analysis, the regression approach, which I was talking about, has gone off on its own. So we have these two kind of research themes, if you wish, going off by themselves. And what we're going to talk about and show you a demonstration of very quickly here is how these two may come together, particularly in the application of transportation. So that's the kind of background for what I'm about to present to you. And I say that because uh, I want to make sure that uh, uh, you have a rough idea of where I'm going with, uh, with some of this presentation.
So this material I put together with one of my students who is now at, uh, he's no longer at, uh, uh, at uh, our program, he's now at the University of Southern California. I told him it's a terrible job, he shouldn't take it because the weather was so bad there. But at any rate, uh, uh, he and I have put this together and it really looks at trying to integrate these two themes, if you wish, that are part of the literature huge literature in, uh, in uh, the area. I wanted to give you some quick background just to say we have been working in this transportation area for quite some time. Here's a set of examples of work we've done in looking at theoretical considerations with regard to transportation all in the last uh, uh, five or eight years. And here's some work we've done on the empirical side. And what we're going to do is we're first going to talk about, we really have two purposes here. One is to understand the regional impact of transportation infrastructure. And the second is talk about general equilibrium models with their capacity to control for spatial dependency. So here are the are three approaches. One is we call the traditional approach, which is the neoclassic approach in economics and it forms from aggregate uh, production functions. This is what I talked about when I said, you know, usually often a regression model in which we have something we're trying to explain, such as output, uh, economic development, number of jobs, and we have a set of variables trying to explain that, investment in higher education, investment in uh, labor, investments in uh, 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 infrastructure of various kinds, in other words, a whole variety of them, which one of those components being transportation. And in fact, we can break transportation up, as you know, between various kinds of transportation. And one of the things we've done in this presentation I'll give you is talk about the subdivision of transportation into pieces, so that instead of treating transportation as one unit, we talk about highway transportation, we talk about rail and transit transportation, we talk about water transportation. In other words, we break it up into the modes of transportation. That's very important, but it's very difficult to get that data. Um, the second piece is to talk about how to extend that very simple model to a spatial perspective, where we talk about the interdependencies of the observations that we're looking at. And we're looking at two kinds of errors or components that we have to control for. One is what we call spatial dependency, and the second is what we call the spatial error. Um, and third, we're going to look at the general equilibrium approach. Why do we look at the general equilibrium? Because it combines both supply and demand in the single model. Okay? That's a very, very important component. The other model tends to take it so we look at the changes that occur in one side of the system, but we don't look at the feedback effects in the system, and that's what happens in the general equilibrium approach. So, in terms of transportation models using the general equilibrium, computable general equilibrium approach, these are a set of examples. There's a huge literature there. Um, Lofgren's model, um, standard computable equilibrium. If you were teaching students, for example, that's one of the ones you would give them to take a look at. It walks through all the steps in how you put a general equilibrium model together. Brooker is particularly valuable because he is one of the early people who has done what he calls a spatial computable equilibrium model. I have to caution you, though, the word spatial here talks about the interdependence between a region you're interested in and adjacent or nearby regions in the system, okay? It does not look at the spatial econometric estimation procedure. It only looks at the, the interdependency of regions around it. Um, Haddad and Ewings in the, uh, the uh, Mariana 27, uh, perfect uh, market imperfection uh, in a spatial economy, um, looks at the application of this. The Pingo model um, developed, in, uh, uh, developed in Australia um, look at, looks again at a spatial computable equilibrium model. And finally, Miyagi in Japan has also looked at a similar kind of application. So these are out here. These are kind of, if you wish, 
little examples from each area that describe a whole cluster of research within those areas. So what we're interested in is a general equilibrium approach. We want to consider spatial dependency to control for spillovers, and we want to uh, make sure that we look at cross-modal comparative analysis. In other words, we want to be able to say, here are the different modes of transportation. We want to separate them out because we know that separately, if in fact prices change in one, you're liable to get uses of another one. There will be interaction between them. And a lot of work at the computable general equilibrium level tends to treat transportation as if it was a unified component. So the research questions are considerations of what is the impact of these uh, economic output in the United States, what's the impact by mode, by transportation mode, and how does that differ when with considering or not considering the spatial dependency question. Um, the other issue hidden in here is although we're going to apply it at one level in terms of what I'll demonstrate to you, we now have models where we've tried to scale it. So although we're going to look at it within the megalopolis of basically Boston to Washington, that region, we in fact have now scaled it by state and then by national. So the scaling issue, which uh, was brought up by Brian, is an important piece of what we're talking about, but really not part of this part of the presentation. So this is a CGE model. It simply says, take a big I.O. model of various kinds that you have available. These are available across the country. It's not hard to find them. One of the most common ones is Implan, but there's tons of other ones out there. This is the one that we've used, which is out of uh, Purdue University, and we've consolidated it down to 13 commodities, 13 activities, nine factors, but it starts as a 400 by 400 matrix, okay? And you can scale it down to a smaller subset. And we have, within the matrix, we have areas of concern. One is consumers. The second is producers. The third is how these are linked together with regard to the Leontief or a, or a constant uh, uh, economies of substitution ratio. We have the government block and we have market clearing conditions. That is, what happens when this process occurs? How does the market clear in terms of uh, making sets of decisions? Now, this just gives you an estimation. On the left side, you'll see a bunch of sectors there. Okay, these are the 13 sectors we talked about. Agriculture, uh, trade, uh, warehousing, information, services, etc. different sectors of the economy. And if you look at the interdependence of those sectors, <clears throat> if you simply run a test of the spatial dependency within those sectors, you can see that there's a huge interdependency. All of the things with stars indicate that there is spatial dependency going on. So if you were to examine only agriculture, um, you would see that with regard to wages, with regard to rent, with regard to capital, there's interdependency. So these are not, if you tried to do, analyze, analyze those as independent observations, you'd be making a huge mistake because of the interactions that take place. So this is for a period 97, 04, 011. We use those only because in running these kinds of tests of interdependency, you have to do it year by year. And that's what we've, uh, so these are just three example years from the period that we're looking at. Now the first step is what we call a non-spatial assessment. And what this is, is simply the component I talked about earlier, where you're trying to explain, say, regional development or uh, uh, changes in the regional economy against a set of variables that you're using to explain that economy. And in that component down at the very bottom, you see it's a simple OLS estimation procedure. The second, the next step is to do what we call a spatial econometric assessment. And that is trying to figure out where 
the dependencies are between these various things. First, within the variables themselves, and second, within the error term, that's the unexplained component. And if you go back, you'll see the error term is the epsilon at the very end there. The last step is to look at what we call uh, a spatial econometric computable general equilibrium model. And what that means is this. Usually when we take a spatial equilibrium model and we have that matrix, what we do is we shock the matrix, quote unquote, i.e. we make a set of changes on one column uh, of that matrix, say a 10% increase in all of the elements in that column due to transportation, okay? or a 5% increase. We shock it in a particular way, and then we see how those shocks reverberate through the system. What are the first level effects? What are the second level effects? What are the induced effects, okay? And we can track them as the inter because of the interdependencies in the matrix itself. The difficulty is that when most people put that shock in place, they use the elasticity estimates from the ordinary least squares model. What we're going to do that's different is we're going to use the elasticities from the spatial econometric model. That sounds like a simple difference, and what we want to know is how much of a difference does that make? Okay? In other words, we can shock it. Here's a set of elasticities. We'll get a set of results. We can shock it with the spatial econometrics, which should represent the materials better than the other, and we ask, what is the difference between the two? The data we've got, we talked about a little bit, 48 contiguous states, 13 sectors. Um, we're talking about the Global Trade Analysis Project, that's the Purdue group that gives us the SAM, and in BEA, we had to pull the BEA data out and separate transportation into the various components. In other words, if you used any of those other models, they would have transportation as one piece. And what we've done is break it out with the BEA data so that we can then run them to see what the comparative analysis is. This is what the structure of the social accounting matrix looks like. Um, we won't go into that right now. And here are some results looking at the OLS, that's the ordinary least squares, that's the kind of estimation that is traditionally used to shock the uh, CGE model, as opposed to a spatial econometric estimate of the same thing. Now, you can see these are very, very close to each other. And in fact, if you look at these with regard to the 11 sectors or 13 sectors on the left side, and our areas of transportation, trucking, air, water, transit, or all modes, you can see where the shocks are the biggest between the two. Whether they're big or not, they're very, very small, right? Look at the difference there on air impact, even on air itself, 2.708 against 2.753, okay? The numbers are small, but they're big enough to begin to make a difference, okay? If we look at the contributions of transportation infrastructure by mode, what we find is that transportation as a whole has a 0 .042 impact in terms of this region on the region's uh, uh, economic output. Public roads are half of that impact. Public roads are the highway system. They by far dominate the system. The next biggest one ends up being air transportation, the third is water transportation, and finally, public transit and rail. And uh, you're not surprised at the fact that that's very small, and we can come back to a discussion of that a little bit later. But that's very, very important. If you've looked at data that have been out there, looking at uh, how well cities are doing over time, very large cities in terms of income differences within the city, those areas that have heavy transit tend to have less income differences within the cities as opposed to those that do not, although the examples that I've seen with that are relatively small, and I think it needs uh, further study to, to really uh, see what level it is. Now, if we take the two differences, you saw the differences there, but if in fact we take 
to traditional CGE, and we take the spatial econometric CGE, and we look at them to see what is the size of the difference of the estimates, you can begin to see that although the differences are very small, the base of the difference is quite large. So our conclusions are that economic impact of public transportation infrastructure in the U.S. is confirmed to be positive under a general equilibrium framework. The magnitude of the impact is much smaller than those in, from previous studies, and that's because we are not double counting the way you do with certain of the um, input-output models of this kind. The study identifies the relative importance of spatial impacts of different transportation modes in the U.S from a multimodal and comparative perspective, and that's one of the first times that that's been done in looking at uh, a C, uh, spatial econometric versus, uh, versus an ordinary least squares estimation within a CGE framework. And that enables researchers to control for the issue of spatial dependencies under equilibrium. Now, um, in summary, uh, I'm given you a lot of things very quickly. I apologize for that. But I think what's important here is that we're talking more and more about trying to figure out how to manage spillover effects in estimation procedures. This is very important if you're going to try to understand livability. Should we, for example, have policies, once we scaled this, for example, we found that um, nationally, uh, air transportation tends to be much, seems to be much bigger in, at a national scale than it is at a local scale, which you're not surprised at, right? I mean, that would be expected almost at, all across the board. And we've done this both nationally, then we did it by states, then we did it by metropolitan areas using uh, 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 metropolitan uh, uh, gross uh, domestic product. Um, one of the things here is that this is, this tries to get at spillover issues. Spillover issues are extremely important, and it seems to me that this is a concern that we all have, and one that relates to this livability question. Um, I'm going to leave it right there, open it up for some questions uh, from the audience, and uh, uh, leave it at that. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of your measure of transportation, what are you using? Fiscal measures? Monetary measures? Oh, we're using monetary In what sense? Uh, discounted, uh, discounted present value. Of what? Of the transportation investments as they change over time. So it's the investments, okay. Uh, yeah, well, the problem, of course, is you do not take into account the capital stock behind that. Yes, you do, because what you it's do a, is you discount it, and if it has a 10-year life, you start early, and so you're looking at the new investments on top of that after it's all been discounted. So yeah. But if you've got, like if you've got a large stock already, you have small yeah, investments. that's in the large the stock pool. basically depreciates over time. Okay, so no, that's fine. Over time. The, the other thing is, you know, how sensitive is this to aggregation? If you take something like um, rail transport, for yep. example, um, it's, uh, movement of bulk commodities is massively different to container traffic. And contiguous states clearly some have got uh, links with bulk traffic, some have got links with container traffic. Right. I'm just wondering to what extent you can disaggregate the data down a bit to get at some of these, not yeah, every nuance, obviously. I don't think you to, can get down that far. Yeah. I think I can, get to, I can get to rail because I can get the data out of, for example, in the Northeast Corridor because that's all public data. So it's easier to get to the rail component. There's both a public and a private sector. All of this by the way, relates to public investment, okay? It does not relate to the private investment. Component. So, in fact, you In fact, be, I think that was the title. Of the it was, right? but, no, I mean, that may, it's true. And that's a very great limiting issue. Well, the, my point is, what I was going to go on to say, that if you take bulk commodities, that doesn't matter too much in the sense of coal and iron ore is mainly carried by rail, so you're separating that out. But if you take container traffic, the links between rail uh, and road are huge, and uh, that's really what was going to be my last question, yeah. which you covered. The, if, it's, if it's on, if we're looking at primarily highway, then when it's in highway, it was carried one way. When it's in the, it, 
you can separate those two out. What you can't do is look at what you're talking about is the interdependency between them. Okay, and you don't really have that. You've got observations of both yeah. pieces separately. Yeah. And I agree with you that the that the question of the interdependence between them is very, very important these days. But put it this way, before all of these models have transportation as a single unit. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all of those all of those CGE models treat transportation as if it's a single unit. What we've tried to do is begin, begin the steps of creating modal separation so that we can begin to do more cross-modal comparison. What you're saying is that's still very limited. And we've only looked at it with regard to public investment, not with regard to private investment. In the Northeast Corridor, public investment is extremely significant. In other parts of the country, guess what? Private investment by far dominates the system. So it, so it has real constraints with regard to scalability. Okay. The, one, of the, one of the issues here, um, when we started working on this livability question, had to do with how do you begin to look at and disaggregate transportation in a way that gets at issues of livability, okay? And one of the things that's very, very important is beginning to begin to try to think of it modally. It's, it's kind of obvious when you're at the bottom up, but when you're looking at aggregate models, they tend to cluster these together. And if you're going to look at questions of trade-offs in health, trade-offs in noise, trade-offs in other things, you have to begin to separate these pieces. And that's what we've begun to do as this is a preliminary step. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Arnold, our next speaker um, is Arnold Nikogosian, who is uh, the Distinguished Research Professor at George Mason and also the Director of the Center for Study of International Medical Policies and Practices. Uh, before coming into the academic world, uh, Arnold was very active in, in, in senior government advisory jobs, uh, including serving as the Chief Health and Medical Officer of NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Uh, and Arnold's topic will be transportation impacts on communities' health. Did you get the, uh, right there? No, I didn't report. But I did. Unfortunately, I think this Professor Haynes' laptop is not window 8 on that. I'm just kidding. There you are. OK, good. So um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Besson for a kind introduction. Specifically, I would like to give my thanks and gratitude to uh, Dr. Stabil for inviting us. and getting that workshop going. Actually, there are two workshops that she's engaged. She's always busy, you know, working very hard. And um, thirdly, I finished my presentation this morning, lost my mem uh, memory stick, so I'm not sure what I have here. Mm -hmm. I finished <laughs> at 4 o'clock. But uh, what you're going to get here is not what you expect. What do you think the impact of transportation is on community? What do you expect transportation does to help? As long as you're not in a wreck, you can improve it. Okay, that's one way. Anybody else? Emissions have a negative effect. Okay, we'll see that. Uh, what do you think is, uh, how do you think health is using the policy of uh, Re-engineering the environment and uh, uh, communities. What role does it play? 
That's a good question. That's what we're going to address. Okay. <laughs> Don't say anything before you hear the story. Okay. So uh, yes, I work, worked in transportation. Yes, my training is in uh, internal medicine, aerospace medicine, occupational health, and uh, environmental health. And that's what I did for a long time for a living. And uh, basically, I was permeated with safety. And then after, two, uh, after 2001, I was imbued with security. But anyhow, uh, I'm not conflicted about it. So what are we going to do? We are going to look at the interrelationship of the, between environment, transportation, and health, uh, recognize issues which surround the safety, security, and health of transportation systems, mostly ground-based transportation. Identify knowledge, practices, and policies aimed at improving the safety and health of transportation systems and community health. And here I would like to remind you that I will differentiate between passengers, operators, builder, and dwellers. There are different categories, and as the regions are, there are different things. So I got a little bit lazy, I didn't put the slide that you all see, which is the lights of, but, um, the image was obtained, a collage from satellite over time, uh, of the pictures of the Earth, and that looks at the cities from space, lights of the cities from space. Any, anybody seen those? Yeah. Very pretty pictures, but they tell you a lot. Number one, they tell you historically where people settled because the high densities are in the coastal areas, right? That's where ports were, commerce, like uh, Professor Haynes said, and what else happens? What can we do with the lights from, besides making a nice tapestry, which NASA made, but what can we tell about the lights from space if we take it over time? Spatial, besides the mosquito picking. Um, what can be done? There is a process called, called an overview. It's the dimming and the brightening of the light. Dimming at night means cities are going away. I won't mention the cities, but they are, if you look on the way. And brightening, it means there is more people flocking to the areas. So really, from space over time, you can see where uh, uh, big communities are formed, communities are merged, uh, and uh, you can start to see the interrelationship how the pieces play a little bit in this complex world. But that's not the uh, but that's not the whole thing. The modern transportation system is becoming a very an interconnected system. You cannot look separately. Uh, the ground transportation versus rail tra or ground transportation, air transportation, maritime, because they're interconnected. And the way the change came in when I came in 1961, 65 to the United States, there was no such a thing as inland ports. Today, there are large amount throughout the United States of inland ports where containers transported overseas <coughs> go to the ports, go on rail, go on trucks and are delivered there and distributed. They bring together a distribution outlet or the outlets which sell those goods and depending on the communities where you are, it could be food or whatever, Walmart and things like that, which happen to come here. And those things are coming from all over the world and become part of that. <coughs> so interdependency on a global scale is becoming more and more of a fact, and is it an issue? We'll see. Uh, transportation uh, depends on where you live and when you want to go and what you want to do with it. And uh, the combination of diverse factors uh, of the transportation does uh, <clears throat> create uh, a very difficult, like uh, Professor Haynes said, a very difficult way to get uh, means to get your arms around the different factors which come to play uh, in the process of assessing the good, the bad, or the ugly of the whole system. 
And finally, what is in the yellow there, if you can read, I can't. The yellow there is that uh, transportation by itself, you know, yes, the people are a major concern for the governments, but uh, uh, Republican or Democrats, they, uh, they designate transportation uh, uh, as a, one of the critical infrastructure. And transport, why is it a critical infrastructure? Because it becomes a security problem, because it can be attacked, or it can be providing goods, benefits, and special transportation, any mode of transportation can become better for infection and diseases transmission. Okay. So what are the interdependencies? And those are a little bit tricky, the interdependencies. The interdependencies are, is there a mouse there? Let me walk to the slide, to the slide. The interdependencies are three, they're very simple. And I don't care you're working with space, environment, you're working with rails or whatever, they're three interdependency. There is a transportation technology. Why there is a te there's technology is supposed to do some things for you and make your life better. Okay? That's why transportation technology. Get faster to work or whatever. But it has to operate in an environment. And the health of the people who enter into that environment and that transportation, uh, it has three meanings. One, safety is paramount to protect people and transportation, to have safe transportation and health. So safety is an intersection of technology and people. On the other hand, the environment, we cannot do, really we cannot do too much about it. You know, uh, like uh, uh, Galileo said, uh, you know, she's turning, just the earth continues to turn. Regardless of what we we ain't going to stop and fly out in space to get, create new launch systems by stopping the earth rotation. So environment is changing. We can accelerate that change, not accelerate that change, but we interact with the environment and health is affected by the environment and especially the engineered environment, which is in that area. So the environment is considered exposure. At the intersection of exposure and safety, we have a prevention model, and that's what we are getting through to see if we do have to make modification, prevention, re-engineering, or plan for things which can make, improve our life, facilitate our life, make us feel better, and make us richer, and not poorer. The positive side. Any questions about that? You can interrupt me anytime you want. I have an accent, and I'm trying to speak slowly. Though my colleagues understand my accent, I hope so. OK. So what are the environmental effect of uh, on health? It's the lifestyle. Okay? It depends what you choose. That's how your health will be affected, what environment you choose. Uh, the design factors. The house, you know, is it a slum? Or it's a, in, uh, okay, it's a suburb? It's a uh, stadium where you go with your kids to see uh, games or whatever? Or it's a rural area? Socioeconomic factors, education and employment make the environment and the choice because uh, you know, in some places you cannot buy a car, which is good. Recent studies came out and said that people who live in the inner city don't have any money. They might be healthy. Yeah, they might be on the skid row or they might be he healthier. Your next uh, topic of panel of money will be on the alcohol, is it right? Okay, and homelessness. They do together. So, but, it forces you to walk. We always say in Ines that we were in New York and uh, we used to find a parking spot for, for the car when we were not, uh, we were just married, spouse, and we used to walk to the stores, you know? And you don't drive in New York to go to the store, okay? You cannot even go to Manhattan these days with a car. You don't have any place to park. But everything was there. We used to walk to the company, you know, small stores, which are not disappearing, but uh, so, uh, a recent study came in which looked at just that one factor saying that elderly people living in inner uh, in, uh, uh, you know, cities have better health. Okay. Uh, and uh, finally, what's in red is that transportation and technology play off each other 
And uh, that's the issue that we can control, but we don't control ours very well. There are things that we can put in our cars or our systems, that's where we spend a lot of time, which make it more human factors friendly. We know from aviation safety and things like that, and military, that if you have to do too many movements while you are changing from one function to another, chances of injury is high for the operator and the people where you operate. For example, in Ellis Air Force Base, I tell my students that. In Arizona, there were training place for Air Force and other planes, and they found that a lot of crashes did occur, especially on landing. And the problem was a design system that I used, which was in the airplane where uh, you would switch, whatever, from one frequency to another when you fly. And uh, one of the buttons were on the bottom here. The other one was on top. So you have to flip that button first as you're landing, OK? Just think about it. Things are happening. You are landing. You cannot control it. You have to have that speed. You flip that button, you turn down and do it, and you dive into the runway or into the community. So till they figured out and put all the switches in the same place, happens. Uh, they didn't, uh, they, they didn't uh, correct the problem. Uh, Honda designs their cars well, used to design the car. And uh, you know, everything is in front of you. There's a lot of other cars when you have to, if you want to tune up the radio, you want to look down. You know, in this moment, you are gone with your car and your radio and whatever. And uh, that type of uh, design, or the new design in the car, which uh, sense that you're asleep, sense that you're whatever you're doing, uh, is there. But can you screw it up, excuse me for saying that? Yes, you could. Because regardless what safety you you know, people say that uh, 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 accidents cannot be foolproof because fools are so ingenious. OK? And uh, what do you, you, you will text message and talk on the phone if you have an automatic car. And at the critical moment when you require your intervention, you won't be dead. So it's not enough to develop technology which helps reduce the accidents. It's also the problem of the operator that you need to deal with to make sure that they're doing the right thing. OK, so evolution of major trade routes. We're using the same trade routes that we used to use but there are three major hubs here which have developed for exchange of the containers or whatever you do and spread of diseases and uh, uh, illnesses and whatever uh, which are here in the United States, in Europe and in Far East. There are three major hubs which 90% of the whole thing ends up there. Okay, so globalization benefit was intermodal aspects of the whole thing. Uh, it's uh, availability of variety of things, improving commerce, improving wealth. All those things are part of the trade routes that uh, have been developed, but the hubs which are there, aviation hubs, they follow also the hubs that were created over centuries uh, in the area where there were, uh, where the, the where technology was not available, but they were using it as sails or uh, ships or, uh, I don't know, rail or whatever. So what is the relationship of technology and disease, transportation and disease? Uh, people who build a lot of roads historically, and we keep forgetting that, Romans, they fell to the plague and disease. Those were the same roads that they went in uh, to conquer, but they brought back disease. Aztec, Aztecs, Mayans, and uh, Incas, uh, whatever was left, they fell to the, they fell to the, um, to the Spaniards, to the few Spaniards who came to conquer them. Why? Because they built the roads, and they were not immune to infection. And infections traveled ahead of the. Uh, on those roads, the infection traveled ahead of the uh, uh, conquering conquistadores and uh, killed most of the people. So when the uh, Spaniards came in, they got a big swath of land and nobody claimed it. Okay. 
So we need to go back and remember that technology brings unexpected results. Do we facilitate things, but uh, it brings unexpected results. Uh, one of the unexpected results of technology on those roads was later on after the Romans were gone, was the plague, the way it traveled. Okay, so you understand what I'm trying to say. The other part that you need to look, it's complex. And I do, I'm not sure how one can look at all those factors, but what uh, uh, Professor Haynes demonstrated that there are multifactorial type of uh, uh, simulations, analysis that you can apply to those things. Population does change. And if you look, developed countries versus developing countries, that's why the crisis is today with integration, developing countries have more younger people than developed countries. Developed countries look skinny, though they're more fat but they're not. So you need to understand who is your clientele in the future when you deal with re-engineering or engineering the community. You need to understand. Uh, you know, the thing that I have, uh, we all learn a lot about from the military medicine, and I'd like to quote that if you look at the way our clothing change over time, you can look at the military uniforms in the museums, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam. You can see the changing shape and form and height and clothing represents that you know, in, in the form of the clothing that we furnish our military. Well, the population follow the way the military is. And the age also is becoming very important. We say education, outreach. Maybe elderly people cannot get re-educated as fast as younger people. Maybe younger people can be re-educated, but they want to hear that because they have the mind of their own till they got uh, some experience, and experience means when they don't get what they want, okay? They get experience. So please follow that logic that we are changing the world, globalizing the world with uh, migrations, immigrations, emigrations, and those will affect what the communities will look like and our transportation, world transportation, was designed for the 20th century. It's not the 20th century. And uh, we are talking about the drones delivering goods. <coughs> Good. You know, houses burning, you know, drones colliding, and all those things. You don't get anything from Amazon. Uh, um, but you know, really, there are people who are experimenting with the next generation of uh, large scale container type exchange and transportation. What are those? Lighter than the air. We are going back to the slow Japan who can over for a long period of time, deliver it where they need to be delivered, and they can carry a sizable amount of weight. I know a lot of people who were experimenting with that, they're still in the experimental mode, but the dirigible are not going away. And we, the United States, possess a lot of heat. Which is safe, okay? We will not repeat the Hindu. So, People are working on that, but they didn't catch it because we have to use whatever we have. You know, that investment into the future might be too expensive, yet we are going to spend what we have on today things and travel at higher speed on rails, which were designed for the mid 50s or whatever. Okay. Occupational. Exposures. I will not read those to you completely, but there are many types. And I would like to point to you that there are the pesticides, industrial chemical metals, dust, fiber. Ah, this one, noise. You told me this Okay, <laughs> I'll be. Noise, noise becoming a big nuisance. From airports and things like that. How much time do I have left? Uh, five minutes. Five minutes, I will not finish. But that's okay. So since Bunny is telling me that, 
happy world. Um, and talk about, so what do we mean by uh, redesigning communities? You know, people have proposed that in order to make communities healthy, we will need to address, and this is from ISET, we will need to address uh, different things like, uh, uh, you know, better transport, more room to walk in and hiking, and, and people try to bring the economic concept of doing that, that you will improve your health and efficiency and, uh, and economic value of walkability, prevent uh, heart disease and everything else. And then, uh, and then people put pictures like that waiting for a bus. You know, that's disaster waiting to come. There are people standing there by the light post and there's a bus coming. And, uh, you know, what will happen? One of these days, a bus will run out over there or somebody pushed down. And then there's sidewalks here, which is really close to the road. And you see all the time, then you're sure it's somebody plowing into the, uh, into the sidewalk affairs. And you see that that's the type of things that you want to fix. And some cities have fixed it, did fix it, like New York City. Uh, Japan started it. And if you drive to Washington, like I did this morning, you'll find that there are barriers between crossings. I know everybody gets upset there is a barrier that cannot cross. But safe, because nobody deals in Washington. You run over. It's as bad become as New York. Okay, so here is a way to um, improve, and that's the New York City, more lighting, better sidewalks, better protection of the pedestrians. And there are some uh, um, uh, recommendations by the National uh, Complete Street uh, Coalition uh, for safety, and uh, they, they can collaborate, work together, and do those things. And that is that good or not? I don't know. That probably works. So, uh, what is the bottom line? We went with a couple of our graduate students, Inihu and uh, Tina Imatangoka, and said, well, let's go look at the literature. Let's see, is there enough knowledge and evidence to tell us that if we are going to improve the environment, uh, the, the livability, you know, make it walkable, walkable uh, as a livable transport, active transport, which is water, bicycle, would that help? And we look between 2009 and 2000, 2000 and 2014, 15 systematic studies of the information, the knowledge base. And you will find that uh, if you look at uh, at um, <coughs> injuries, it's a strong recovery. It happens. It, it really prevents injuries when you do engineer the environment. Preventing injuries and preventing death will reduce the expenditure of health uh, in the hospitals. But if you look at obesity, obesity, it's a very weak correlation. If you look at the lung problems, and if you guys want, you can ask, uh, I will, uh, you can ask me by email, I will send you that, that information. If you look at the uh, lung, expo uh, uh, lung cancer in the areas which are close to highway, freeway, those are international studies and natural studies. Yes, in children you have a lot more cancer than you will have, uh, and it's a good thing. But uh, you know, a lot of the things that they are have a big correlation, and that goes back to what uh, Professor Haynes was saying, that, uh, hey, there are too many factors for it. You need to look at what you need to measure, and we don't have enough knowledge to deal with it. So when we make decisions on the evidence, which is not there, <coughs> it becomes pro problematic. So somebody gets the money, they start to engineer the environment, they forget about their health because they don't have to think. So more studies are needed. Finally, Regulatory and standards do apply to operators, but they are done by different agencies in the United States and different agencies internationally. And policy legal consideration, CDC developed guidelines, but CDC funded that study that uh, walking, creating a walking environment will not reduce obesity. Okay, so here you can debate that. And finally, 
that the, the intersection of travel and environment is a complex thing. You have to look where you're traveling for, where the transport is working, and you need to look at different levels. Like uh, uh, Professor Benson said, that you need to look at the scalability, what it is that you're trying to address. Okay, so I have to move slides. The bottom line is that we are trying to remove the risks, or address the hazards, or remove the threats. So what's a hazard? Is a source of danger to health implies a threat. In other words, since 9-11-2001, we stopped having hazmat going through the cities. But spills happen, yes, they do happen without terrorist attack. Risk is an undesirable health outcome, probability of morbidity and or mortality, and threats is a factor which can affect the health issues. How do we handle those? Since we identified in that matrix all those things, how do we handle those? Well, it's a very interesting way. We divide them into the, that's we always did, playing games uh, for budget, managed. A risk that is continuously monitored to intervene with administrative, financial, or technical action when the risks exceed the set limits. And the set limits can be also political. Okay, we won't do anything till it happens. Acceptable is a risk that cannot be eliminated, politically, budgetary driven, can be subject to efficiency, type two, and effectiveness, type one errors, which is, in, I'm sure, in uh, Professor Haynes' uh, model. Uh, what are we talking about? We don't tolerate drunk driving. We don't to tolerate now text messaging and drag. We do tolerate uh, lipstick and eyelashes uh, or mascara work uh, in the car. And we do tolerate, unless they are cold, people eating and drinking at the same time without driving. Okay? So we do tolerate we do not tolerate the lack of seat belts, but we tolerate the rest of the deaths, which are due to other factors than alcoholism. Okay, so that's an acceptable. Tolerable is a risk that can be eliminated, that's what I'm talking about. But a significant cost, that's what the problem is there. And it's subject to political opinion and decisions. Hey, you can run polls for the rest of your life here. It's a very fertile ground. And Alara, you should know, as low as reasonable, achievable. You cannot close the loop for something. Well, you say, as long as I can measure it, that will be the limit. Radiation is the best risk. We cannot make it zero. It's on Earth or any place else. It's there. So we stay there. Uh, we stay with that. And, uh, uh, toxic exposure, there are some things which zero tolerated, others are okay. So I leave you with those thoughts that uh, the relationship between health, transportation, which is technology and environment, is not that clear. There is no clear cut barriers, or there is no clear cut knowledge there, which can say definitively, if I don't do it, there will be a lot of people who die. Hence, I cannot develop an economic model here say that I will, to so many lives say, because for each death that you have because of the transportation, there will be probably 1,000 injuries. And the, 1, 000, uh, the death, uh, you know, I will be very harsh. The death is over. Person died, this lawsuit proceeds, uh, they will put a stop sign. But the 1,000 injured for each one death cost money, litigation, medical care, loss work, uh, workplace uh, losses, and things like that, absenteeism. And uh, you need to remember those that you need to take the risk into consideration and the lack of knowledge when you deal with it. Thank you. 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 Okay, then I get off the stage. Uh, I yes. Just, I got a question. Most of the medical advances in the world are in developing in developed countries. Your doctor's medical what? Advances 
in surgery, in medication, or in developed countries. There are countries with high income. How do you generate the high income in these countries? Well, according to Kingsley Haynes, it's by having better transportation. So by having better transportation, you get better medical care, and you live longer. How do you know that? Because that's the causality of your two papers so far. How do you know that? What's the state of evidence? I don't know. I didn't see anything in that state. I'm sorry to say that, but uh, well, I didn't see any state of evidence. That the paper did not pop up. In front of well, let me ask you the question. I asked the first question. The first yeah. question was simply, is it not true that yeah. most medical advances are made in developed countries with high income? Depends. Well, let's take a, let's, how many medical advances have come out of uh, Botswana? How many medical advances have come out of Nigeria? Well, we don't know. They don't publish. That's the other problem. <coughs> well, one of the problems is English language and cost money. And those people don't publish. That's one of the issues of lack of uh, communication about... Okay. Uh, well, put, it in, uh, yeah. uh, put it bluntly. Where did vaccines for polio come from? They came from wealthy countries. Where did heart surgery come from? Wealthy countries. Medication okay, basically let, is let's the research you Vaccine. Vaccine. The origin of vaccine was uh, Middle East, Africa. They used to buy it. Vaccine means back. Well, it does. Uh, they uh, had it. But they weren't used to buy it. That's where it came. The knowledge came from there. Okay. But the rest of the knowledge came by necessity in the Western country from the military, because they had. Uh, well, had the that's military. fine then. That doesn't affect my argument. The military. Uh, which are the most mil powerful military countries in the world? They're wealthy countries. And where does wealth come from? Transportation. And you, you've got yes. to take the fact that if you have better transportation, you generally have better, um, you have more public health facilities, you have better medical well, treatments. Well, but that doesn't well, there, is no, there is no such evidence. If you have more transportation, you have better health. That doesn't hold. We cannot find it. I told you that all the things that we claim, even the CDC claims as better health is when you re-engineer the environment, we cannot, I couldn't find, and maybe I'm wrong, there's always the uh, element of the doubt that I uh, missed on uh, some of the analysis, but uh, so it doesn't look that we have a strong evidence because so many variables come to play. Well, let me ask a question. Yes. Um, am I likely to live longer going to North Korea than staying here? Uh, North Korea. Well, they will shoot you, but uh, I'm sorry. If I'm not shot, I if I'm not shot. Transport. If uh, I go to Rwanda, you, you I like to live longer. Uh, so what's the, what's the longevity in North Korea? Uh, the, question, years the question would be better, years better asked, would I live longer if I stay here or go to Russia? Well, if I may, if I may break into the Zubusku dialogue, I think, I think we've identified a, a, a new a new workshop for Bonnie to organize. <laughs> and yes, Bonnie. We can have we can have Ken and Arnold will be the protagonists, and uh, you're willing to take on Sergio. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, All right, I, any, uh, I, I'm not going to fight with so you. So excluding you right, Ken. excluding Dr. Button, are there any other questions for Dr. Miskinigos? All right. Thank you very much, Arnold. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You need a cup of coffee. No, I'm going to move myself. <laughs> <laughs> I went to go to sit next to you. <laughs> All right, let me now introduce Lori, Lori Schettler, who is an associate professor of public policy uh, at the uh, School of uh, Policy, Government, and International Affairs, which we're all trying to learn how to say. Uh, and Lori has published extensively, if you were to look at her publications list, it goes on page after page. Yeah, those were great questions. But uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the areas of transportation and associated disciplines. And so Lori's going to carry forward Arnold's discussion on health issues and looking specifically at transportation and health food systems. Oh, sorry. I've got to hook up your hands. Can I just use this computer?
Okay, so as no, no, you got it. Okay. Can she just set this on the stand? Okay, great. Uh, so as Brian mentioned, um, the, the theme of my talk is transportation and healthy food systems. Uh, and essentially what I'm going to try and do here is make the point that uh, most of the work that's done, been done on food systems, in particular food security and insecurity, has focused on the local level and global level, but there's been very little work and effort uh, at the regional level, and uh, we need to do that. I'm going to hopefully make that case today. <clears throat> okay, so first, um, let's start out with a definition of livability. So everybody has a different definition. Uh, if you go to the USDOT website, uh, you'll see a very, very, uh, I'd say, constrained definition from Ray LaHood. Something, his definition of livability is, I'm able to hop on a bus anytime, anywhere, and get to any place. Um, it's pretty limiting. Um, but it's, it's much broader than that. So um, according to USDOT, uh, livability uh, is a place where coordinated transportation, housing, commercial development give people access to affordable and environmentally sustainable transportation. So the question is, where, does, where do food systems fit into this? Well, it pertains to health. And uh, one of the uh, aspects of livability, of the concept of livability, is health. Um, we, we are concerned about access to affordable and healthy food choices um, <clears throat> and uh, food distribution systems that are environmentally friendly and, and clean. Um, so that's what I'm going to focus on. And again, I want to stress here that you know a lot of the work's been done at the global level and local level, but we need to focus on the regional level as well. And this tag cloud here, this is kind of interesting. I, I, this might fit with what you're going to talk about, Ken. Uh, livability is, what is it? Everything to everybody. Um, so Twitter had a contest to see who could come up with the most clever tweet of what they thought livability was, and then they generated a tag cloud. And so if you look at the words here, I mean, there's all the obvious things here, community, community and neighborhood transportation. But in that tag cloud, you'll see um, health-related terms and also food. So overview of the lecture, I'm going to first um, talk a little bit about uh, food systems and transportation, how transportation fits into the whole scheme of things, and, and look historically uh, and work up to the present. And then I'll, I'll focus a little bit on some of the issues and challenges, particularly as they relate to um, food security or insecurity. And let, let, I'll conclude with some uh, policy recommendations and, and research agenda. Okay, so where does transportation fit into um, food systems? Well, it comes in in a number of different ways. It's not just transportation of food to the market, but it also involves transportation of machinery, pesticides, etc., to the farmers, raw agricultural products shipped to processors, pro uh, produced and processed goods delivered to wholesale distributors, wholesales delivering to retail restaurants and institutions, and consumers traveling to and from markets and restaurants. So transportation plays a very prominent role in food systems, um, moving the raw materials to processing plants, processing plants to wholesale, to retail, ultimately to the consumer, and the consumer going to uh, consume, consume the food. So a um, little bit of history, um, this is before our time. Uh, so for most of human history, this is an interesting quote, um, perishable foods uh, were by definition local, um, they travel far only if they were, if, if they could be kept alive, sorry, alive and breathing. Um, so I thought this was an interesting quote. Things have changed considerably. Um, and, you know, back in the 1900s and before then, uh, most food, as we all know, was produced and consumed locally, and, and, and things have changed considerably. Um, so one of the, the key trends in food transportation uh, has to do with food miles, uh, which is the distance food travels from source to retail or consumer, and food miles uh, have increased significantly over the last uh, several decades. Um, so just to give you an idea of how far food typically travels, uh, I have some examples here. Um, so uh, fresh produce from California and Florida, I guess your, your avocados that you get at Giant, 
Um, travel on average 1,500 miles. Um, just another example, breakfast cereal. So your Wheaties in the morning, I guess, travel on average 1,350 miles. And milk and eggs, which of course are more perishable, travel, travel lower distances, uh, 50 to 75 miles on average, but they do travel quite far. So there are a number of reasons why we're seeing an increase in uh, food miles. Uh, many of these things we're very aware of. One having to do with consumer demand and, and people's preferences. You know, um, personally, I like my avocados all, at, at all times of the year, so I'm willing to pay to have them transported to Giant at any time of the year so I can get them. Um, we also have uh, another trend, global agri-food industry fueled by cheap energy and transportation subsidies. And subsidies actually play a pretty big role. I'm not going to get into this here, but they are a large factor contributing to this trend we're seeing. Um, of course, technological advancements and things like refrigerated trucks so that uh, we can actually transport those eggs over longer distances. Cheap oil, not always, but generally speaking. And of course, trade policy is another critical factor here. So this was kind of interesting. Uh, why don't we have just local food production? Well, I, I found this interesting uh, statistic here uh, relating to New York City and the state of New York. And uh, to satisfy USDA nutrition requirements, the 8 million residents of New York City would have to consume over a ton of food a year. Um, New York State, um, based on farming, uh, production of food, would only be able to feed 55% uh, of the residents of New York City. So food obviously needs to be transported in uh, locally. Uh, again, preferences play a role here and people are uh, very willing to, to pay more money. And as I go through these slides and look at these trends and issues, again, I want to stress that many of these things are regional in nature. nature. So, you know, you can't produce both food locally 100% and consume it locally. Um, you have to bring it in, you know, from the region and beyond. Uh, again, consumer demand, I've already talked about preferences, uh, also, of course, population growth and aging population, and people are getting very picky about their diets, uh, a lot of gluten-free folks out there, and I'm actually gluten, I'm trying to be gluten-free and uh, lactose-free and all that, so people are willing to pay to have that food transported in, to whole, whole foods. Um, specialization, so here we get into a little bit of the regional economics, so um, of course, there are competitive advantages and reason, re, reasons why regions specialize in certain types of food production and processing. Um, we know that it has to do with the environment, the climate, the soil, availability of infrastructure, including transportation, of course, uh, local regulations, and population demand. <clears throat> and as an example, um, we can look at where the hog production is located. And the, yes, I'm actually from the area right in the middle of that hog production there, Iowa. Um, I don't know if anybody's been near a hog packaging plant. <laughs> Nonetheless, okay, here's an example of regional specialization. So again, here we're talking about regions. And of course, industry consolidation, so um, there are efficiencies to be gained by um, consolidating activities, processing activities, wholesale activities, etc. And here again, you see sort of a regional specialization and, and location. And this is interesting. So just to give you an idea of the complexity, you can't see everything on this diagram. I love visual things here. Um, but this is a schematic showing the global food system and all the different components. So if you took a good look at this, you would notice that transportation fits in here very prominently. We have all sorts of other things going on, culture and politics and regulations and all sorts of things going on in the, the food system. And in this diagram, if you had a chance to look at it carefully, you'll notice there's actually a good regional component in there. So it's not just global and it's not just local. Okay, so what are some of the issues and challenges? So again, we're dealing with a, a, an issue here when we talk about food security, um, which is again, access to affordable and healthy food. And, and just to make the point quickly, I know that people have their own preferences and some people prefer to eat McDonald's, but in my mind, livability, talking more broadly about livability, is all about choices and having access to choices. That's the, the bottom line here, and we don't have that. 
So um, when we look at globalization of food transport and supply, we find out, in fact, yeah, there are a lot of benefits. And we talk about convenience and variety. Uh, in certain cases, we have lower prices for consumers and food distributors. But there are a number of disadvantages and negative implications, um, food insecurity being one of them, uh, implications for health, the environment, energy, uh, economic uh, as well. Okay, so what is a food desert? Let's talk about the health implications. A food desert is an area where a major number of these shared residents do not have good access to supermarkets or healthy food choices. Um, and an area also where the, the food choices are very expensive in relation to the, the income there. Uh, one particular definition I found is, uh, people come up with their own definitions of food deserts. Uh, low access community, at least 500 persons and or 33% reside more than one mile from a grocery store. Um, and there are profound health implications. We do have evidence to support that, that um, these kinds of things lead to uh, obesity, heart disease, etc. cetera. So um, what, what's coming to play here when we talk about food deserts? Well, um, we have issues related to development and sprawl and lack of good transportation, um, and also plentiful amounts of unhealthy food um, which are perceived and often uh, are cheaper than healthy food. And so a lot of work has been done look, looking at this locally. So this is Washington, D.C. identifying uh, food deserts. Um, so what they've done is a buffer analysis looking at different neighborhoods and how many supermarkets or healthy food choices are located within those, those zones. But this goes way beyond um, just making sure when we bring this back to livability, it goes way beyond just making sure that we have a bus line going from a poor neighborhood to a farmer's market. Okay, it's a little more complex than that and, and regional in nature. So um, a lot of work uh, has been done. Here's a map showing um, counties classified according to whether or not they have a car and whether or not they have access to supermarket within a mile. And you can see in the south, southeast is where we have problems with regards to this. And I won't go into the details of these tables, but lots of statistics that people have generated showing that poor people and, and persons of certain uh, ethnicity and race uh, live within these food deserts and don't have access to healthy uh, and affordable food choices. And a lot of this has to do with transportation. So um, some of it's local. Uh, some of it does actually involve making sure that we have uh, public transportation and other modes of transport to get people to the, uh, the food, to the market, restaurants or, or stores. Yeah, okay, and just quickly, uh, I wanted to make the point too that uh, rural areas are affected by food deserts and actually we do find quite a few food deserts in rural areas, uh, which is very important to note. But the other issue here, um, so it's not just providing um, transportation at the local level so people can get to those uh, food choices. It has to do also with um, the cost associated with transporting different types of foods, processed and, and also um, raw, raw goods. So this is a pretty interesting diagram because it compares um, Transportation of um, processed foods, uh, you can see this would be something along the lines of your chicken McNuggets at McDonald's. Um, the modes of transportation that are typically used to transport the raw materials to the processing plants to the, the restaurants versus uh, whole foods. So here we're talking about, you know, say produce being transported to whole foods grocery. And what we find if we look at this diagram is that uh, in terms of transportation costs, the cost of transporting materials for the processed goods are much higher than they are for the whole food or for the whole goods. Okay, so that's a that's a big issue, and that affects us locally because at the end of the day, the healthy food options are much more costly than the um, un unhealthy options. We also have implications for the environment. Um, there have been actually a lot of different studies looking at this, and and the fact that. The transportation that's used to bring the, um, the produce and the processed goods to the local regions um, generate a lot of emissions, a lot of evidence to support this. Um, this is something that we need to look at. 
And again, coming back to the types of transportation that are used to move um, processed goods versus uh, whole goods, uh, what we find is that the processed goods uh, consume a lot more energy and generate a lot more emissions than the modes of transport used to transport the whole goods. Okay, and uh, this is an interesting figure showing um, the increase in energy input uh, compared to energy output. And this is energy input related specifically to food systems. Um, so this is a huge issue. We have huge uh, environmental implications that need to be dealt with and studied. Um, and also, uh, if we look at uh, energy use by different types of food system activity, we see that, uh, let's hone in on uh, transportation here. Um, energy use that comprised about 11% of uh, total energy use in food system activity back in 1940, and it's now increased to uh, 15%. So comprises a, re a relatively decent share of the energy use. And we can look at different types of um, activities here. Uh, again, uh, looking at transportation uh, and, and a loaf of bread. Um, transportation consumes about 14% of the energy that's um, generated or used for food processing. <clears throat> okay, we have also economic implications that need to be studied, and these are regional, not only local, but regional uh, in, in nature. So um, what we're seeing here is that uh, back, you know, back in the 1870s or 1900s, as I stated at the beginning of the presentation, much of the food was produced locally and consumed locally, but that's now shifted. And if we look at apples, and this is Iowa, we see in 1870, all of the apples were produced and consumed locally. And now you can see the slice of the apple is very, very small. And so what does this mean? So um, if you know anything about regional economic development and multipliers, what this means is that um, the multiplier effects actually generate economic benefits outside the metro area or outside the, the local area. And this is something that I think needs to be studied um, further to see what the implications of these trends we see in, in transportation of food have on the regional economies and, and what we can do to try and stimulate the economies uh, through uh, better transportation. Okay, so um, Again, uh, the purpose of this talk here was to uh, focus, focusing on food security and food systems. Number one, show how important transportation is in terms of food systems activity and, and also food security, but also to emphasize that we need to go beyond looking locally and globally and also pay attention to what's going on regionally. Uh, many of the implications are felt regionally and uh, many of the policies that we need to address and implement would be implemented at the uh, regional level. All right. Questions? Laurie? Yeah. I would like to ask, uh, just because I don't know, I would like to ask that, yeah. that question. <clears throat> you know, there were publications, good publications, of experiments conducted in looking at the food spoilage in different Spoiler. places, spoilage. Spoiler. And that was, uh, or freshness of the food. And that was determined by, you know, people went to the stores, different uh, supermarkets in different places of the cities, and they took uh, swabs, right. and, and uh, they look at the number of microbes there, which was an indicator of spoilage, right. or freshness. And they found that uh, basically in the poorer areas, uh, people are giving, uh, people have access only to the food which is close to the spoil, mm -hmm. not that much. And uh, <clears throat> they documented also that after Katrina, the same areas continue to serve the same way uh, the food. And uh, really, I would like to congratulate you because you look at the deserts, uh, <clears throat> food deserts. But did you, uh, I assume, I thought I hear you, saying that you took into account the, uh, which areas are providing pressure food that orders, or there is no way to find it? 
No, we can find out that information. Um, I mean, you can get information and maps of where farmers markets are located and, and supermarkets and, of course, fast food restaurants and, and map all that stuff out and, and look at it. I didn't look at it personally. Yeah, they found that the you know, supermarkets study. cater, like you said, they do cater less variety to the poor in the poor areas, but it's also less fresh food. Right, that's, that's the freshness of the food and the variety is a little bit difficult to track. Yeah. Yeah. But they go hand in hand, less variety. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. We were more than glad to discuss that point. A couple of things. Yeah. The, the issue of food security, though, it deals so much with definitions because, you know, you're talking about a food desert and, you know, it, it's all this, but food deserts have great food security in the sense that, okay, it may not be what we consider to be the healthiest diet, but there's not famine. I mean, you right, know, right. It just, you know, so maybe yeah. that, that something there's, there's right. Yeah. But one of the things I found interesting is that your heat map that you did of the of this areas where you don't have a car more than a mile away. Right. It was interesting, the highest concentrations, as you know, in the south of Italy, particularly Louisiana and Mississippi, right. were oddly enough, rainfall and, and weather, general temperature conditions, mean that you have the greatest likelihood of having locally grown produce. Right, I, I, I thought I mentioned this, but actually many of the food deserts we see mm -hmm. in the United States are located in areas where food is produced, right. ironically. So, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, so, so the question, no, so the question is, 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 I mean, Again, it's definition. The issue. Right. Right. Food the food desert food really, food you know, it's a great definition, you know, just by focusing on whether or not some fast food, of course, any more. These are restaurants with business models themselves where right. you go to Wendy's, for example, and is it great food? Not by any stretch of the imagination, whether you're talking about healthy or tasty. But, like you know, the big yeah, the, but that's just it. Every, most of these quote unquote fast food places are now offering. Options that are not quite as processed. Right. You can right. have the salad, you can right. have fruit pieces instead right. of French fries. Yeah. So we can, you know, we can provide opportunity, but consumer behavior is choosing one over the other. Right. 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 One point that I just want to interject is that these fertile areas that you point to are not growing, they're growing crops that are subsidized that they're sending to other regions and that don't produce healthy food choices. Um, they're growing corn, sending it out for biofuel. So though paradoxically it's a fertile area, stuff that's edible for local inhabitants is not getting eaten. Um, and the other, another point that we're talking about definitional distinctions, while the availability of food is very good, um, if we talk about nutrition or malnourishment, so those people have food energy as evidenced by their body weight, but they are malnourished. So it would be really hard to model that. Oh yeah. Um, but that's an important distinction that's hard to get our hands around. At one of the bigger health problems in this country, I'm told, although I personally don't suffer from it, is obesity. Uh, do you actually have the opposite to uh, food deserts and actually areas where you've got a surplus of food, which is cheap, leading to people eating too much and being extremely overweight and dying young? Right, that would be interesting to look at. Well, it's a bigger problem, I think, than people starving in this country. But that is what a food desert is. Yeah. A food desert is where there can be an abundance of terrible food. It's just the scarcity that you speak of is, yeah. is unhealthy food. No lack of choice. But then you still need to, it would still be interesting mapping out where obesity occurs and the excess, uh, you haven't actually done that with what you've got. Right, right. Uh, but obesity, I think, is a major problem. A surplus of food in the yeah. not a glut. And not a shortage. Yeah. Future research. Trending. <laughs> Um, is there a is there a U shaped curve with respect to uh, higher incomes and lower BC and low incomes? In other words, is there a what's on the y axis? You say U shaped. Well, I'm trying to understand the if your income is high enough, yeah. you make better choices. Not necessarily, but but at a population level, yes. Lower obesity, but yeah. So I mean, as evidenced by out health outcomes. Yeah. And then look at Bill Clinton. Goes to McDonald's every day, right? Not anymore. Oh, not anymore. Not okay. Since heart attack. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, but but to, if I can relate that to your initial presentation about modeling the 
transport input, input to, to, to measures of economic prosperity. You know, the, looking at this question of, of, of what constitutes a food desert, you know, it, it, is, it, what's the transportation input of that? Or, or perhaps, perhaps it has to do with the management of supermarkets, you know, based on, based on income. Uh, we find, may find different management, uh, you know, management practices. You may find different consumer choice uh, packages. So e e if you were able to do the mapping in terms of unhealthy eating, you know, what, what would be the, the role uh, of, of, of transport in that? And that would be for, for our purposes in terms of what we're trying to do, transportation and, and, and uh, you know, and, and the good life. I mean, that would be something that we would yeah. want to follow up on trying yeah. to, try to get a grip on. Um, yeah. So any, any, uh, any further questions? Uh, I particularly liked, uh, particularly liked uh, the, the recurring theme of scalability. This is a critically important case, and what, what, what a perfect case study in scalability is. So, great. Okay, thank you, Lori. Um, okay, great. So, uh, next is Terry Clower, uh, and Terry has uh, just joined our school, uh, and um, he is the um, uh, he's both the Northern Virginia Chair and Professor of Public Policy at our school, and he's also. Uh, Deputy Director of our Center for Regional Analysis at the school. And Terry held uh, similar responsibilities uh, before moving up here. He held some similar responsibilities at the University of North Texas, so we can get some uh, geographical perspective. And uh, the topic, if I'm, if I'm correct, is transit system impacts on workforce development. Or uh, is that evolved? Wait, nah, that is evolved. So we, so so you'll, you'll be surprised. <laughs> How's that? I will let you. Yes, thank you very much. Well, let's see what we can do here. As was preparing, we got to get you. Uh, oh yeah, I'll, I'll do that in time. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, as we were discussing, and, and Bonnie, thank you very much for the, uh, the invitation. Having just arrived, uh, was thinking about the various issues and looking at the, you know, what some of the other folks would be talking to that we've heard today, and of course, and then. Ken following up after this, shifted just a little bit. What I find my experience in dealing in transportation issues, particularly in regards to the public debate, oftentimes it focuses on moving people about town. That is the, you know, where you uh, livability, and as Arnold was talking about, you know, sidewalk safety, et cetera. Lori made a great transition for me into this, into hit, hitting on one particular aspect but I want to take an, an idea or to talk a little bit more about freight overall as, uh, as a part of the livability of the equation. When we think about trucks in the city, if you will, and we're thinking about livability, and, and mind you, and maybe I just came from Texas, but I did focus my examination on this and also some of the commentary are really very much DC centric and Virginia centric. But you think about it and you're looking at these pictures, what we have here are just some selections of trucks that are double parked. And what that does in, you know, in terms of your transportation flows and more, I have certainly uh, had that happen to me in, in around cities. You, you know, you're trying to get someplace in a hurry and inevitably somebody is delivering something. Now, you know, there are they're, they're value judgments in that. That one on the lower right, at least it's a food truck that's double parked, so you can presumably get a snack. Now, I don't know if it is a healthy snack or not, but more importantly, you know, the one that you're trying to get to the pub and you can't get to the parking place because the beer delivery truck is sitting there, you know, but, you know, some things are worth waiting on. Uh, but the idea is this is much of the perception that you see among people who are most concerned about livability factors, which quite honestly are typically urban dwellers. Uh, you, you, you get out in the country. I, I in Texas, I was living on 10 acres of land, and livability to me was a matter of keeping the rest of you damn people away, you know, and being far enough away from you, right? That, and then I'd commute in to, to work, so it wasn't such a bad deal. If you get into this perception thing, so we got two pictures here. Uh, you know, in reality, when we're fighting traffic coming in on uh, the highways, there will be trucks interspersed with a lot of, of traffic. 
But if we get into the public debate, if you go to public hearings and you listen to what state transportation commissioners are listening to, you would think it'd be more like on the right. Now, obviously, since I found a picture, there is a few places in the world that that's reality. But that is what that is what the public perception and what we oftentimes see public decision making supporting. One of the examples I talk about are these now that we're seeing uh, increasingly popular in different parts of the country. The uh, no truck lane, cars only in, in this particular, you know, in a particular lane. Uh, and I'll speak to more to that in just a little bit. Virginia, you know, now, now that Virginia is my home state, I wanted to, uh, to open up and consider this. And this is just a, this comes from the Virginia DOT and it is a matter of corridor congestion. And, you know, it doesn't look too bad in Brown, mostly, you know, green, you know, fairly easy flow with a few yellows here. Of course, you get some congestion down there around the Virginia Beach, Hampton Roads area, and then, of course, in the D.C. area. But I think starting to look at when we talk about freight, the circumstance in Virginia and many other states is quite different than what I'm used to. 80% of all of the traffic, that freight traffic that is moving in the state of Virginia has an origin or destination outside of the state. And indeed, 40% of all of the truck traffic, or all the freight, and this is specifically trucks, all the uh, truck traffic through Virginia is passed through. It's coming from someplace up north, going south, or east to west, whichever direction it's, it's going, of course. And, and the idea is that, that Virginia is a conduit state in that sense. And that changes the dynamics a little bit, and, and certainly changes it economically. Um, The other thing that I found interesting is, and this gets a little bit to something that, that Ken said earlier, talking about you know coal shipments on rail and, and these differentials, but when we're talking about value, 90%, 95% actually of the value of goods that are moving in Virginia are moving on truck, and this is because it's large, you know, it's finished product, and of course, in some of it, as I suggested, much of it is not actually made or consumed here, but passing through. If we if we bring this into a little bit um, into the D.C. area, of course, then you're starting to see those nifty red areas and mean that you have major congestion issues. For folks that are living here, this is no great supply. That's this morning's what we will uh, call a BFO, a blinding flash of the obvious. You may have experienced it coming in today. Um, I was fortunate. I arrived in August during the you know kind of the slack season still, so I got a little spoiled for a couple of weeks. But I think that will be coming quickly to an end. But what is interesting, this market, for not having a big industrial base in the D.C. area itself of production, you are at the crossroads of two major interstate freight corridors. The 66 is considered a major regional corridor, and of course 95 is you know, a hugely important corridor for movement of freight up and down the east coast of the U.S. Uh, if we look at some of this, combined, it, it was just a couple of things that were as interesting. On I-95, which takes you up right through the middle of Washington, 54% of all of that traffic, freight tra tra truck traffic, is passed through, not stopping. Now, of course, what do we typically do to address that from a transportation standpoint is we build a loop, right? Well, you notice how well 495 works anymore. Uh, so we have to build the next loop or the next loop after that. And even in the Dallas-Fort Worth area where we're not constrained by, by uh, Chesapeake Bay or, or other natural features at all, our, our long distance, our future transportation plan is just these series of further and further loops. And of course, the axiom in all transportation planning is no matter what level of infrastructure you build, traffic will increase to fill it. That is unless it's the bridge to nowhere in Alaska or something like that, and we have some of those too. Um, on I-66, about 4% of the trucks passing on I-66 I are handling goods that are produced locally, going outbound. About 18% or so, and there's some rounding area, but about 18% or so is inbound. 76% of the trucks on I-66 are passing through town. And that, again, is a you know major implication when we start thinking about those, those congestion pictures. Now, 
though, to put some value. I brought you, you asked for value, and I'm going to give you some, some value on it. Basically speaking, inbound trucks into DC, according to the VDOT, it, are bringing in about $8 billion worth of product, about 10 million tons, something like that. That sounds low to me, and, and I'm, I'm questioning a little bit, but you have to be you have to be a little careful with some of these numbers and getting into an issue that, that uh, Ken brought up about the uh, about double counting, and certainly Kingsley knows this. If you look at the reports done for VDOT, they will say that roughly 50% of economic activity in the state is related directly or indirectly to transportation. Now, contributions to gross state product are close to about 25%. That is, again, reflective of an interesting nature where you have much economic activity happening here in the D.C. level, in the D.C. part of the state, that really is not production. That number is much higher, say, in Texas, where where I come from, where we have a lot bigger manufacturing base, if you will, where you also have the oil and gas production and all the, the transportation that that drives. But the point is that in D.C., you certainly are seeing a lot of traffic that is not directly benefiting you, uh, if you will, economically but you still have to accommodate that traffic on the road network, which brings up some, some interesting uh, livability issues. So when we think about this, certainly there's increased congestion, travel delays that we've all experienced on the roadways here, uh, changing our travel mode choice. I mean, I, I am quite sure that, that I'm going to get my former Texas citizenship you know, revoked because I actually will get on the metro system. And, and I say that with tongue in cheek because we actually do a lot of of transit work in the Dallas-Fort Worth area when I've done a lot of that work. In fact, one of the things is that our big regional and, and good cargo airport, we actually have a light rail connection to before DC does. We just opened up this, uh, this summer the uh, DART system so you can actually come to DFW Airport, get on a light rail system that will take you into downtown Dallas. And I think that's a game changer for us in terms of convention businesses and things like that. But Congestion costs, infrastructure stress. Remember about trucks, the thing with them is that one is you're running you're running heavy vehicles and indeed you're getting an increase. We're seeing a, a real pressure in the systems for accepting larger weight shipments. As you bring in containers from overseas, you know, they may hit the ground, you know, weighing, you know, instead of having a weight of around 50 or 60,000 pounds, they may weigh 70,000 pounds. You have companies that are very much pressing to get a 100,000 pound gross vehicle weight up from the current 80,000 pounds that you see in most states. Some western states have higher levels. Now think about that from a design capacity standpoint. Of going down the road, it's a much heavier vessel, uh, vehicle. Here where you have lots of bridges, every time you enter a bridge, you ever feel that little bump? All of a sudden, you got a big, heavy, dynamic load going up and down on that, and it causes substantial deterioration in the infrastructure lifespan. One of the good things in terms of livability that we're starting to do in transportation is look at life cycle cost and to consider how these design characteristics, but you're doing that under constraints of <coughs> fiscal environments as well. Air quality, we've talked about a little bit. I'm going to talk about that, and certainly public safety, we have, we've talked about that. But the important thing here that I think is a contributor to livability is that our transportation system is, built, is bringing all of the crap that we insist that we must have to enjoy living. Uh, having just moved here, I can tell you that we are consuming lots of crap. We got rid of lots of crap, you know, but to keep from having to pay to move it, but now we have to refill the house, of course. Uh, that's why housing markets are so important to the economy overall, because you can't move in. You know, it's a complete delusion, guys, if you ever think that you can make your furniture work from the old house to the new house. <laughs> Just get over it, it isn't gonna happen. Uh, but we want this stuff, and we want it now. So livability, and in some respects, is what do we want it to be, and, and, and given that. So how do we start doing things to try to address some of these issues? Well, the, the strategies that are, are being taken actually in place in different areas is truck route diversion. Certainly we've seen that. You can't. You see that in the D.C. area. You cannot drive a truck on this part of the road this time of day. Uh, 
we see that elsewhere. We and think of it in terms of the old hazmat chemical. You see that you know if you're dry, if you're bringing in hazmat, you can't use this particular road. You have to use this road over here. We're seeing increases in that. Now, one of the things that that um, a team that that I've talked to before, we would love to get into studying would be is can you develop systems that are more dynamic so that as you get roads that are deteriorating, you actually identify those roads before they've got massive potholes in them using ground penetrating radar and such and start trying to work with dispatchers in the trucking and logistics firms to route trucks around that, give them a little bit of a stress reduction. Assuming, of course, that there is no budget for repairing the roads. Uh, state's, what, two and a half billion dollar shortfall at the moment. Um, Truck only car lanes, uh, you know, we love to, the public loves to exclude trucks. Quite frankly, in this market, given the 54% of trucks that are not stopping at all, you ought to have truck only lanes. Let the truck be in a lane, does not have to try to dodge the cars weaving in and out of it, and they, they go down the road. Um, but that's a bit of a political fantasy. If we look at grade separation, uh, certainly that's where we see a lot of the work because if you think about it, there's a lot of markets, whether it's a commuter rail or a light rail system or a freight rail system, at grade crossings. Doing changes in grade crossing is very expensive to do. Um, if you think about it, that if I want to take a train and make it a non-grade at grade crossing, I have to be able to acquire land about a mile either side of where I want that crossing to be huge, huge expense that the, that the various state DOTs simply don't have the budget for anymore. But it is separating that person who wants to walk across the street or that person who's trying to drive their car or the minivan full of kids across the road, get them out of the pathway of the freight vehicles. Uh, let me go back, I'm sorry, let me go back on that just a second here. Um, no, wrong direction, previous. Sure there was an easier way to do that. A couple of things that, that uh, the pictures over here that I offer are some examples of that. That very top picture is a conceptual drawing of a uh, technology they're calling a freight shuttle. Uh, it is being developed, uh, Texas A&M Transportation Institute has a big hand in this. Uh, there's some private money behind this one and it's basically uh, a driverless freight system. You load a container onto this uh, uh, electromagnetic driver and it goes down the road. They are actually building a demonstration project on that for El Paso, a uh, very narrow thing, but what they really want to talk about is in the state of Texas, we're getting that freight out of the port of Houston up to the Dallas market, so basically up the uh, uh, 45, Interstate 45 corridor. Um, the other that you see down in the bottom down there is the Alameda corridor where they actually have sunken the rail lines down below grade level. Uh, and that's a the picture down in the bottom right, though it's, it's hard to see details of it. That's what it kind of looks like from the surface. So you basically are creating artificial channels. Now, we'll assume that, that that's also, do you remember the movie Volcano? So the next time you know they have a volcano in, in uh, uh, Los Angeles, they can just have a channel for all the lava to flow down. But the, uh, the, the idea here is, again, this great separation. Though I would argue to you that there is nothing about that, that whole imagery of the Union Pacific uh, train there in the canyon that contributes to livability in the sense of aesthetics. Uh, these are not particularly pleasing to look at, but again, safety is the, uh, the moral right. Another one, uh, in New York, you have off-hour delivery programs. They basically say you cannot do deliveries in the cities uh, during rush hour. And things they're trying to do. Boy, that was, had to have been a fun one to negotiate with the unions. There are things that you can do if you have industrial processes in a community enough to where you can say shift the change of, of the uh, of shifting. Having worked in uh, manufacturers and in transportation functions at warehouses, distribution centers, you know, if you think about starting at 7 o'clock in the morning, you, you wouldn't take, you, you don't ever actually unload trucks about a half hour before shift began, or, you know, or before or after shift begins, but that means that you're putting the arrival of trucks, because they don't want to be delayed, they have hours of service limitations, all that, right at 8 o'clock in the morning. Could you actually talk about shifting schedules, and those are some things that, that, that come to play. However, that's going to deteriorate your greatest service. 
that's going to mean that you don't necessarily get your goods on the day that you want it. I think it's uh, absolutely phenomenal to think about what we have now in terms of service. Average delivery time for Amazon is about 3.6 days. And that means that, that's average overall. That means there's a whole lot of things that you can get out of their fulfillment centers that they have scattered around the country. You order it today and it's on your doorstep tomorrow. And they're looking to try to do same day delivery on some, on some items. That is spectacular. Sorry, I mean, this is not even like the old mail order catalog days from when I was a kid where, you know, it was the four to six weeks was the standard delivery time, all right? Um, but don't look like you're surprised at that. You're old enough to remember that. No, I, mean, uh, I was just reading yesterday about in the First World War where soldiers from the trenches sent letters to Scotland and got a reply in the evening. Hmm. So I think we're actually going backwards rather than forwards. Well, maybe we are. Maybe we are. Uh, hope, uh, but we're, hopefully we're not going to do trench warfare anytime soon. Uh, the freight village concept is one that DOT is promoting a lot. Uh, and that is the notion of the live, work, and play kind of the same area. The uh, Raritan Center, they hold out as that, but it's very much an industrial park development. It's in New Jersey. Uh, it, it's... You know, okay, you can get that working in certain cir certain circumstances. Silicon Valley, for example, you're working for Google and they have their little buses they'll take, you know, that. Now, the, you know, the good side of that is that makes it maybe more livable. It also means it's very convenient for you to work 18 hours a day. Um, you know, so I don't know what the underlying motive there is. But um, this Rare Time Center is one that it's really interesting because they've in included some the convention center, but they also do entertainment at that. So you're getting some of the, the play elements of it. Uh, and there is one, and this gets into some of the issues that, that Kingsley is dealing with in his work, is that one of the important connectors is that the center itself built a local railroad so that their customers, their tenants, could actually connect it with the uh, Class 1 railroads. So it was as much the enabling, the necessary condition of infrastructure investment was actually a private investment in that part. And of course, and that's one of our great challenges is that we simply, unless the developer wants to tell us how much that they spend on that, we simply don't know um, in many of these cases. But it is an example of something to think about, and that's one way of doing it, of just saying, let's make better workplace spaces. What are all alternatives? I'm going to end with this one, because it's just like, okay, if we don't want freight and we don't want to do it, what are we going to do? Well, the image on the left, if you don't recognize it, that's, our, that's your uh, 3D uh, copying capability, so we can all, we'll, we'll just you know have these sitting in our living rooms, and all the stuff that we need, we'll make it ourselves. You know, I cannot wait until you know, like in Star Trek, I can you know look at the wall and say you know filet mignon with a uh, with a Rockford Shiraz. You know, if, if it can do that, I'll be really impressed. Uh, but the other is, of course, the drone thing there in the middle, bringing stuff to you. You know that there's you can't see it, but a little Amazon box on that. Now, coming from the part of the world that I was raised and spent most of my life, that is urban skeet shooting, is what that amounts to. Um, and, you know, there would be more entertainment that way than actual delivery. Or we can do, but go back and as, uh, as you know, some would suggest in terms of the food security, we all grow it ourselves. Let's just forget about it. Let's go back to the 19th century because things were so much better back when you lived to be 50 years old if you were lucky. All right. Um, with that, I am going to kind of end this tirade and just open it up for questions. But, to, but just let me just say that it, the, the issue with, with livability is that we have to acknowledge, I mean, we just really have to embrace this notion that we still have to move goods into, out of, and through our economic areas and where we want to live, and we have to live together with that, despite whether or not we want to. Thank you very much. Got to be some truck haters out there or truck drivers. <laughs> Gonna take on Terry. No, all right. Very well, good. The, I mean, one of the real issues has to do with uh, uh, we all shop online mm -hmm. and we create delivery systems that uh, that can be then allocated to parts of the parts of the system at the time. So we can deliver at night. We can deliver. That's a I think what we're seeing is the logistics um, 
research is trying to get a, a better handle on that. But there is this balance because what you're doing in it, I, I, I don't mean to make light of it, but what we're doing is we are promoting, getting further and further down that pathway of instant gratification. We want it to, you know, we want it to be delivered. We want it to be delivered quickly, uh, you know, and you know, and that's fine. But you're also using under uh, places that are under capacity at the time. I mean, mm. you know, if you get delivery between midnight and three in the morning or whatever, sure. it's not heavily. You're using infrastructure that's there that is not being used otherwise. Well, and, and well, then that's an extension of the off delivery hours. You know, what you know. You, Here's an, and this may be a completely kind of uh, off base thing, but you know what, when you said that, you know what it made me think of is companies that, that get better electric utility prices for lowering their demand during peak demand periods, right? In, in Texas, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon, it's 103 degrees, you know, and, and do you get the companies to say that we will ramp down our production activities from two o'clock to six o'clock, and then we will kick back up or at eight o'clock at night or whatever, and for doing so, we get a substantially lower electric utility price. Well, I wonder if you could actually get that to where the more efficiency, because let's face it, if you're doing deliveries to homes, dropping things off at the, you know, that you don't have to sign for, and they're coming at two or three o'clock in the morning, you wake up and it's on your doorstep kind of thing, less traffic congestion, less safety risk, uh, you're spreading out, you know, you're spreading out those issues. So I think it's a you know, very interesting model of, of you know, how you do it. Yeah, Ken. I, I think one of the problems, the problem, one of the issues is that the last mile problem is now done in motor car. Mm. The delivery at home is growing, but certainly out of town shopping centers and so on, with people delivering the goods to their own home from a retail outlet, that causes local congestion problems and network congestion problems. I don't know, and it would be interesting to look at the situation around Washington but the amount of traffic has just fallen, but congestion has gone up. I suspect that's because traffic is crossing across, crossing, crossing over mm -hmm. the main arteries into DC, causing congestion at the crossover points, because that's where you get the worst congestion. It's the trip chaining, which goes with the people collecting goods from shops as they come home or they go to work. I suspect that is a major issue in the freight movement. It really is, and it's one that I've done, uh, and now not DC-based work, but I've done work over, uh, over several years looking at the impacts on property valuations and, and more recently rental rates for commercial properties. And one of the things that's interesting is that transit systems do not, the presence of a transit station does not impact the value of property for retail site locations, not at least in, in the areas that I do, because one is, you know, if you're on a good major shopping trip, do you really want to get on the metro system carrying four or five bags? No, you want to throw the stuff in the boot of the car and, and drive home. You know, so it, it's a it's an interesting dynamic that you get in trip purposing, you know, winds up affecting that a good bit as well. I think. With, oh yes, sir. I had a, uh, a question. It's my observation in the Greater Washington area. Um, that during rush hour, whether you're talking about the Beltway or I-66, actually there isn't very much 18-wheeler uh, traffic. Uh, mm. And I'm wondering whether common sense would suggest that there's a self-adjusting mechanism here. I mean, the trucking firms obviously uh, are going to go far slower if they're if they're tossed in if they're tossed in rush hour. Whether they, to a certain extent, are self-adjusting their shipping schedules to to be on the road. Uh, at, at, well, there, there's two factors that come into play there. One is still, it's not necessarily self-adjusting, it's regulatory because you have hours of service restrictions on driver time, as you well know. And if I spend two of those hours, I mean, drivers yeah, usually sure. get paid by the mile. You know, how far they go is, is, their, is their operative question. If they're local drivers, it's by the hour. But if they're on the road, well, if they spend two hours of their operating window on that, that's revenue out of their pocket. I mean, that's salary coming straight out, so they try to avoid it. Your trouble that you have with that is the parking issue that you get. You see some at some places that we have in the uh, in the D.C. area and other places where certain times of day, you know, you, the, uh, the roadside parks or what you want, but rest areas or whatever are just loaded up with the trucks because they're basically just sitting out rush hour. And it's not, it's, 
Now, it's not exactly the same issue of the phenomenon I've seen here of people sitting on the on-ramps that still wait for 6.30 to happen so they could zoom onto the, you know, the roadway legally, but, but uh, you know, but it, it is this, it is this notion that if you're not, if you're going to say self-regulate, that's fine, but what are the cons what are the economic consequences when that backs up into the system and flows down system that delivery doesn't happen as soon, so, you know, theoretically you're increasing inventory carrying costs because it takes, you know, it takes longer to do, but the, the bigger operational care, uh, problem is simply where does that truck park while it's waiting to, to wait out the, the rush hour. Thank you very much. All right, thanks very much. Okay, finally, to bring this all together is um, our uh, university professor and director of the Center for Transportation Policy, Operations, and Logistics, Ken Button. I might say, Ken is, I want to say two things about Ken. Ken is a very prolific writer. We have, I believe he has 80 published books and 400 published scholarly articles. And Ken also has a rich consulting experience. Among his other clients have been uh, the House of Parliament and OECD. Uh, so uh, with that, I will turn the, uh, turn the podium over. Thanks, Brian. I've been changing things a bit at the back because I was not the final speaker originally, but my function is slightly different. So I'm uh, trying to get to grips with this. How the heck do I find my PowerPoint on this? Um, Just open, open folder, two, two ones up, the yellow one. There you yeah, go. That one. Ken, to be honest, we assume that wherever you were in the schedule, you would give a cosmic overview. Well, if I could get going, I would. Why well, can you master this? I use Mac and Josh. <laughs> some, some, I'm not a computer. I only have, I, my first degree is in computer science. <laughs> Paper tapes with holes punched in it. Um, <laughs> I haven't got to the interactive stuff really yet. And um, when I do, I use Macintosh. It's actually program apples before Macintosh was invented, so I'm a little bit behind times. I'm going to try and tie things together a little bit, but I also want to inject some of my own stuff in it. It's the what the yell um, And have I scroll up and down just use the arrow keys. That's great, thanks. Great, thank you very much. Oh, there we go. Right, um, notion of livable transport is an interesting one to me. It's something which uh, has cropped up in the last few years. Um, I'm very ancient, you can tell by colour my hair. Um, roll up. Oh, here we are. I've lived through the age of accessible cities, I've lived through the age of mobile cities, now we're in the age of livable cities. Um, the jargon seems to change regularly, the actual ideas seem to change very little, and the policy prescriptions we have thrown at us seem to have changed very little over time. Um, why we have to change these things, I don't know, but it does suggest if you keep having these, these um, different ideas, that perhaps there are some problems underlying them. Oh, well, I come to that later. Sustainable, it's, no, you don't have sustainable cities, you have sustainable development, Kingsley. Um, I, I, I will come on to that later. Um, but the main problem we have, and I'm going to deal mainly with cities, because I think that's the main issue. If you go to other countries, uh, obviously sustainable transportation or livable transportation, whatever jargon you want, is often a, a rural phenomenon. India, for example, has a policy of keeping 40% of its labour working in the agricultural sector, and that has got some severe and very serious difficulties in serving them and getting their goods to the market. Um, the main problem in cities is what? Mainly, it's traffic congestion. This is uh, the worst congested city in the world, according to uh, latest statistics. That's Brussels in Belgium. Um, I'm not quite sure it's distinguishable from anywhere else. The latest number suggests that's the most congested. We have other, we have other cities that try to uh, deal with congestion in various ways. Pedestrianisation is one methodology, but you can take that a little too far. This is Milan in northern Italy, where they introduced uh, pedestrianisation, but they didn't limit the number of legs which it applied to. So we have a rather animal problem there at this particular time. But we've got these difficulties we know about. Now, we're talking about aggregation. Brian well, talked about aggregation earlier. And there's a tendency here to think in terms, in the United States, in terms of cities, states, and national. But one of the big problems with livable cities, I'm going to talk about what it means in a moment, but taking the term as we've heard generally today, is that it extends well beyond simply what we find here. 
We've got congestion in virtually all the major cities in the world. That is China's Beijing. Massive congestion. We've got situations in Cairo where they seem to be driving at right angles to each other. Um, in Europe, we drive on the left, and America on the right. Apparently, you drive uh, 90 degrees to each other in Cairo. It doesn't just apply to motor cars. We have congested cities uh, which tell other forms of transportation, some four-legged, some two-wheeled, and so on and so forth. So the problem is almost global in a sense. What do we do with traffic? And we call it and give it fancy names, but really is how do we handle traffic in cities? That's the guts of the matter. And congestion is probably <coughs> the core issue we think about, but we do have also increasingly have issues of problem, uh, 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 pollution, environmental problems. Um, this is a, a view of um, Beijing. You can see the cloud, the uh, skies and so on. I was talking to uh, a student the other day and talking about um, international schools in Beijing, and the one, uh, they spent some time in, they had a glass dome in the middle of their sort of uh, auditorium in the school uh, which had oxygen pumped in it where the, where the children actually stayed and spent their time. So it's a serious issue and we don't realise it's quite so bad in this country. So we've got a lot of issues in cities and really that's what livability is about. How do we coexist in cities at the same time as uh, dealing with environmental problems and uh, inefficiency in the transportation system? There's a difference between the two, by the way. Often one hears about the problems of congestion and the environment as being almost synonymous. That's not strictly true. Um, congestion, in my view, is a little bit like uh, the problems you get in a factory or some other activity where you've got too many people doing the, the same sort of thing in the same place. You're only affecting the efficiency of that productive activity. Pollution is when you affect people who are not doing that activity. In other words, transportation affecting people living at home, people in the countryside where some pollution spills <laughs> over. So there's a significant difference, and this again comes back to the degree of aggregation you look at. I'll just show a little diagram later on to, to highlight <coughs> that particular point. Well, what do we, oh sorry, what, what's the problem causing it? Well, the main problem is we all know the growth in transportation. This is China. Uh, growth in blue is uh, cars, uh, red is trucks, tremendous increase in the hardware. Uh, China still only has about five cars per thousand people. United States about 700 per thousand people. So think what happens if this continues in terms of pollution and in terms of congestion. In India, the same sort of population has very similar sorts of figures. So, you know, we focus on this country, but the real problems are actually emerging elsewhere. And we've not been able to solve them for a generation, so it's going to be really challenging in these other places to do it, where the problems are much larger. Um, let's look at the environmental situation a moment to do with transportation. The problem with transportation is it produces a multiplicity of environmental challenges. And these I've got it down in two dimensions, it's a very stylistic diagram. The types of uh, environmental damage, some of which are very local, that's measured on the bottom axis, so the closer we are to zero, the more local they are, and some are long term and some are short term. If we take something like noise, very local, and it's very short term. It's also the thing most people complain about regarding transportation, by the way, if you do surveys. Uh, traffic noise in cities, airport noise. In Europe, of course, a high-speed train is a massive source of noise, and one of the biggest complaints of the environmental damage of high-speed trains. Um, oh, the other extreme, we've got CO2, greenhouse gas, leading to uh, uh, global climate change, warmth in some places, uh, instability, uh, cooling in other parts of the world. In the middle, we've got other ones. Uh, NOx, which is acid rain. Uh, that is something which is produced in a city but can spread outside. Most of the NOx pollution, uh, for example, in Scandinavia, was produced in Germany. Most of the NOx pollution in Canada was caused in the United States. We did we produce, reduce that. The point is, handling these things has got two issues. First, the jurisdiction. Local problems you would think to be handled locally, largely they can. But when it comes to regional effects like NOx being caught in Germany, affecting Scandinavia, that is a different issue altogether because the causality is an entirely different place to where you actually get the impact. So what's the appropriate level of jurisdiction, if you like, for handling that type of problem? CO2 is a global one, and we do have some global arrangements and efficiently uh, working as they are, which we're trying to do that through the Kyoto agreements and so on and so forth. 
So that's the first issue the fact who's got the jurisdiction, how should that be arranged, and that's very much, I think, in the, in the vein of what we talk about in terms of uh, dealing with livability in terms of a local, regional, national. The other problem is trade offs. You've got all these forms of environmental damage being caused by transportation. Reducing one can often exacerbate another. Reducing NOx, for example, uh, with catalytic converters, uh, increases your fuel consumption, so you get more CO2. I was involved in Britain, I was House of Commons advisor for an inquiry uh, looking at um, the removal of lead from gasoline. Lead uh, causes brain damage to, to small children, so heavy metal accumulates on the ground, doesn't spread very much, but it comes in contact with children, it causes brain damage. That was fine, except to get rid of lead, you had to put aromatics into gasoline, basically benzene and various chemicals you heard about. If you smell gasoline at a petrol pump, that's what you normally smell. Um, but you don't want to smell it, because if you've got asthma, it exacerbates asthma, it doesn't cause asthma, if you've got any hint of asthma, it gets worse, and it also causes a various forms of can cancer. So don't, whatever you do, smell gas, uh, gas station. It's not good stuff. Um, so you solve one problem, you cause another, and this is the major challenge when it comes to things like livability. What are the priorities of different groups in society? Because you can't actually clean up everything. You have to train up one against another. Therefore, some people's perceptions are that we should focus on local, uh, local pollution, this tends to be very much the American sort of view in general, not particularly because Obama is apparently, I think, going to make some statements soon about global issues, or at least introducing legislation. Other countries are much more concerned with global issues. Um, so you have a challenge. Noise. Noise is an interesting topic. Uh, what do we mean by a livable noise level? Lots of studies of this. Doesn't. Interesting thing is, the answers you get depend, by, depend on the country you look at. Believe it or not, the stereotypes actually hold. The Swiss really want a quiet lifestyle in terms of less traffic noise. The Italians, on the other hand, they're frankly impervious virtue to traffic noise. So you do get some stereotypes coming into this. But what does livability mean? If you're an Italian in the middle of New York, you, want, you don't care too much about traffic noise. If, on the other hand, you're someone from parts of Europe centre of the in the uh, Midwest or somewhere, Scandinavian descent, you tend to want uh, less noise to be living. It's a, a challenge which has to be confronted. So that's the, uh, the environmental side. It is complex, and different groups have different priorities. One of the debates have been in, in terms in uh, urban transportation have been largely technological and engineering, putting in new plans for dealing with it, uh, controls. The thing I was actually going to spend some time talking about was on active traffic management, but as I said, I got diverted uh, to some extent. We've done a big project on that recently. There's been some interest in planning, but we still try and build, buy our way out of most problems. It often involves political motivation and vested interests. Um, by vested interests, I mean lobbyists who have got particular technologies they want to sell and to put in place. But political motivations are also uh, uh, underlying a lot of it, as we notice with the bridge to somewhere or nowhere which really have very little transportation context. And there is a danger with politicians that they look not to solve problems they've got, but to try and cover up the problems. And we heard today about poor people and uh, wealthy people, and poor people having less access to good transportation. The problem there, I suggest, is not the transportation problem. The problem is we've got poor people. And uh, what you tend to find is you, you, instead of tackling that particular problem, we actually subsidise transport or some other inefficient way of solving the notion of equality. That is very inefficient. Um, it leads in transportation context normally to too much transport. We've got too much car traffic because of congestion in the environment, so what do we do? We go and subsidise public transport, and as Trevor said, as Trevor said the, the road fills up. 66 just simply fills up. Um, and, and it doesn't work in many cases. We have a lot of efforts to get people moving to bus and public transport. What do we find? Well, what's the largest public transport system in the world? Someone give a guess. The US school bus system. By far the largest. Any of you who have children, meet children, see children, 
what happens when they're each driving age, they switch to a car. They switch from a mode which is free, safe, picks them up at their door when needed, takes them home, has priority over other traffic on the road, but they switch to the car. So we have these ideas we ought to provide things like public transport, but they've not solved any of these problems. We also have very narrow ideas, and uh, we, we start thinking about uh, how to do things, and we tend to think about uh, sustainable development very much in terms of the environment, very much in terms of uh, cleaning up the situation we live in. It's a bit wider than that, and I'll say a few more words about that in a moment. As an economist, we have very few economic elements in this. And economics is simple. It's making choice, knowing what your constraints are. It's making your choice which mode of transport to use, knowing how much it actually costs for you to do it. And that is one thing we have very few accurate signals for in the United States transportation system or anywhere else. We go on a road, we don't know at the point of using that road the cost of that trip. No idea of the road cost, no idea even of the fuel costs. So we haven't got an economic model at all to actually um, make our decisions about livability. Everyone has a different idea, but they can't exercise their views. They can't bring about um, what their, their realization of what they want to do. We do have a nice definition of livable transportation in this country, which Laurie alluded to, and the one I like, uh, by Ray LaHood, the former Secretary of Transportation, as she said, basically, you can go and see a doctor, drop by the grocery, or go to the post office. Uh, you'll notice that we have two elements here, like the medical side and the post office side, which most people outside of America don't consider particularly effective in this country. Um, Arnold's not here, but the French life expectancy is two years longer uh, than the American life expectancy, and their medical services cost one third. And um, the post office in this country, as the School of Public Policy knows, having had leave fresh from other people, is conceivably one of the largest drains on the cash available. So we're talking about getting to inefficient things, using inefficient things, which I really, really like. Um, I mean, it has a feel to me of how to move around. And we've got to do this without using your car. Well, of course, we've got a model for this. We can do this. We can look to see how it works. We have a model. There are cities where they do not need cars. This is the capital of North Korea. You can walk wherever you want to. You can walk to your doctor. You can walk to the post office. You can walk. You can cycle. The question is, at what cost do you get this? Because there is a cost of achieving this. You've got to understand the difference, in this, in this difference is in turn of sustainability. This system is environmentally sustainable. I went to the Arnold asked a question about life expectancy. North Korea, I knew the answer. North Korea is ranked 119th in terms of life expectancy. So you have livable cities, but you live to be 64 years old or something, compared to 80 something now in this country. So there's a cost. Um, the challenge is, why can't we move forward? Why can't we actually have livable cities in a sense of environmentally livable, congestion-free, walking, and also having a good economic lifestyle? Well, first of all, um, we are very short on information. A lot of the information is missing, data is missing, uh, linkages are missing. Kingsley was pointing out we've got a plethora of models which need to be linked together to tell us things. And what we get, we're not altogether certain about. We don't know the difference between uh, modes of uh, transport which are used to carry things, we've got sets of data on the public sector, masses of data on the private sector, but inconsistent between firms. We don't actually know very much about the role of transportation. I think we doubt the first one, transportation economic development, I think he would agree we are pretty uncertain of what we know out there. Forecasting transportation, that's appalling. I do a lot of work on forecasting. It's even worse when you think that much of the forecasting done is bias. In this country, Virtually every transit system has over forecast its ridership by several hundred percent and underestimated the costs. I like the case of a railway system when everyone likes high speed rail, uh, service in Spain between Toledo and Alvesina, uh, 38 billion to build, 18 billion, 18,000 a day to run. That's in proper money, euro, not dollars. Passengers, as I told my students yesterday, in the back, nine a day. Um, they missed their forecast rather badly. But it linked up cities because livable transport in Spain is defined as having high-speed rail between all the major cities. 
So it's the livable system according to the politicians. That's the idea of livability, but is it sustainable? I doubt it. Livable transport, Jamie talks about public transport and so on and so forth. But why have people switched historically? We had all these things, even before my day. If you go back to 1900, we had walking, cycling, public transport. We had the old car. We gave them up. We had trains that run faster in the 1930s than they do now in this country. We gave them up. Why? Because people didn't perceive them as a livable mode of transportation. That's one suggestion. Um, we got the problem of um, essentially paying lip service, I've got time so I move on rapidly, to this notion of sustainable development and the two are linked. And I'll just um, say a little bit about sustainable development rather than go through all these points. You have the PowerPoint for one afterwards. Sustainable development has got three elements. You've got economic sustainability. No one here I'm sure has read the Brinkley Report from 1987 which spelled out the ideas of sustainability. The main criteria, the first thing, is to feed the world's population with a reasonable quality of food. Um, that was a primary element. And you have to do that without causing social unrest and without damaging the environment. It was not driven by the environment. The environment was taken as a constraint in achieving uh, the output of food. And that's important because you've got to build these things together. Now, if you take uh, North Korea, they've certainly got a cleaner environment in the cities, but they certainly haven't got a very good diet, and their economic performance leaves a little bit to be desired. So you've somehow got to bring these three things together. And the danger is we tend to talk about livable transport or sustainable transport, where that's not the idea at all. The idea is essentially what you have is a holistic approach. The whole philosophy of sustainable development is it's holistic. In other words, if you just take transportation, we talk about um, reducing fuel consumption by cars. That may or not, may not be a good idea. Sustainable development means you have to restrain the consumption of fuel. You could use more in cars if you wanted to, provided you reduce it somewhere else in the economy. It's not about sustainable transport, sustainable food production. It is basically about the resource base. It goes back to the idea of an economist called Ken Bolding, who gave a totally forgotten seminar at the University of Maryland. Someone found the notes a few years later, and this formed the basis of much of this thing. Very remarkable man, and probably won a Nobel Prize if he hadn't died earlier. So we've got holistic. It's holistic in terms of sectors, which is the third one here. It's also holistic across time. We don't just have to think about current consumption, we have to think about future generations. We have to conserve. It doesn't mean we don't change. It doesn't mean we can't dig out iron ore and produce cars because we can transform the steel later into something else. But we don't waste things. We leave resources for future generations. It's also holistic, as Kingsley was doing with his work, in terms of spatial linkages. It's holistic in terms of you taking account of what your actions do on other people next to you, an externality in economic terms, in other regions, in other countries. And you've got to take all these things into account to get something which is livable, if you want to use that term rather than sustainable. And that's challenging. And each individual has got different priorities within this. And Laurie put a finger on it when she started off by saying livability is ultimately about choice. Because everyone's got their own notion of what the trade-off should be. And what I, my view is very simply that if you want a livable transport system, you've got to use prices. You've got to use price mechanisms so people know what the cost of their actions are. And they work. We have, you know, we have situations in cities around the world where congestion has been reduced by charging people taking their cars to a city centre. We've got situations at airport, uh, in airlines and that, where you've got charges on different noise levels for the engines, so quieter engines are coming to place. More generically, uh, there's been efforts to uh, reduce some um, we're just introducing leaded fuel into differential taxes to get leaded fuel in and phase out leaded fuel out. If you don't have the correct signals, people can't make the right choices. We all love everything. I would love to wake up in the morning and have a bottle of caviar. I'd love it. That's livable life for me. I can't do that. I know it's going to cost too much. Um, and you've got to know these things so you can make rational choices. 
So as an economist, my main view is that livability has got all sorts of definitions. I don't care what they are. What you've got to do is have a mechanism which allows people to reveal what they want to do, knowing full well the implications of their, their actions. Um, there are issues with it. I'll just quickly go through these. First of all, is that um, livability just a fad? Uh, we've been through periods of accessibility and mobility. Um, has it been put in place for ulterior political objectives? Every politician in town wants to have their little legacy. Uh, the hood wants to have livability. Um, what evidence is there to support the fact that people actually want so-called uh, livable solutions in terms of what we see? And the evidence I see is that people don't use the buses when they're provided. Uh, the evidence is they certainly don't use Amtrak very much. Some people on Amtrak are subsidized by $1,000 a trip. Uh, they don't really want to use the metro into Washington. The full cost of using the metro is around about $18 a person if you add in all the fixed costs, uh, uh, interest rates and so on. People don't want to use them. We actually force them to use them. We force them to use them by, um, by giving out subsidies, which I personally don't agree with. Um, move on. Finally, um, people need to make clear trade-offs. And we do a need, if we're going to talk about sustainable uh, transportation, uh, livable transportation, we do have to think of it in a wider context of sustainable development, which is beyond the ideas of livability we see and beyond transportation. So that's a few casual comments I have put together in the back row rather than talk about active traffic management, which I was going to talk about. So any questions? Thank you for an excellent talk and an excellent adaptation to certain experiences. Any questions? questions? was invented in Japan because in Tokyo you have to have a garage for your car and since land space is expensive the garages are very narrow you get out the back uh, so you have smaller cars in Tokyo which are quieter than the larger cars but you can actually reduce noise in cities by very sensible uh, methods of the traffic management because most noise is associated with uh, acceleration deceleration braking and so on so um, uh, I think just some countries actually take that into account more and actually when they plan their their systems, they, they do that. I think uh, you've got a situation in Washington which was actually designed for horse-drawn carriages, and uh, uh, you've got short periods between lights and so on and so right. forth. Plus the fact, plus the fact, the roads in Tokyo are smooth. Another cause yeah, of noise that's, that's, is a smoothness of roads. You can't even hear a car coming at the time. That's right. Be careful. I mean, if you're not, if I, you're on one of the arterial. I was in I was in uh, Korea the other day, and I was in a electric car and you had a choice of the artificial noise for the engine yeah. Yeah. so people don't get hit you could have it revving like a ferrari or whatever else but you had to have some noise on it that people knew it was coming yeah. <laughs> actually ferrari is one option i'm not kidding yeah I'm serious yeah. <laughs> the car's about this big <laughs> Since our panel has, has, has drawn to a close, uh, half a dozen of you who have been uh, uh, patiently participating, uh, you know, if any of you would like to make any observations, not just questions, but any of you would like to make any observations, uh, feel free. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much to the panel for an outstanding presentation. Thank you so much.